Is Donald Trump a racist? This is a question that is asked all too often in America today. And I say that not just because it's disturbing that we have a president that leads us to ask such a question on a regular basis, but it's a really, really dumb question for a number of reasons. Let me explain. Racism. Like, the, the, just the word itself. Is Donald Trump a racist? The definition of racism from Merriam-Webster is a belief that race is the primary determinant of human traits and capacities and that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race. Now, to put this in context, uh, I, I, I'm a fan of the Avenue Q song, Everyone's a Little Bit Racist Sometimes. Now, I if I were to play that song or a clip of that song, uh, we would get triggered by, or we would trigger uh, the YouTube content copyright recognition software algorithms and and we would get we would get in trouble with them for that so i'm just gonna sing it for you uh you're welcome or thank you to everyone's a little bit racist sometimes doesn't mean we go around committing hate crimes now if i sing it badly enough see we won't trigger the the the, the sensors and the content recognition but I, I love this song because it really points out the ridiculousness of this accusation of racism now i'm not saying that racism isn't a problem it's a, it's a real issue that, that there but it can, even even to use that term here is that really what we're talking about when we say hey we have problems related to race in the world today so a belief that race is the primary determinant of human traits and capacity well that as a belief, you go primary determinant, the primary determinant of, of traits and capacities. Now, it, it, this is you have to unpack these words to realize how useless this term is. So, primary determinant of human traits and capacities. Now, so if you say, well, uh, you know, I'm, uh, you know my traits you know my, what what are, what are my human traits do i like intelligence uh my capacities my my intelligence my physical beliefs you know so is, is race the primary determinant of these things well in a sense i i am a human being with with a, a variety of races that i i could identify with uh do, do are they the primary determinant of my human traits or are they the, the reason i exist as a human being Right, I mean, you can't say I'm a human being and, and exist like in a bubble without, without any kind of ethnic heritage. So does it determine my human traits? Well, if my race is human, you know, if I'm of the human race, I, I suppose. Well, yeah, then it's it's certainly the primary determinant. You know, and if you want to break that down into ethnicities or you know, separate races and say, well, you know, you're this because you're this or that because you're that. Well. If there are human races, I mean, like, what? Wh why am I, uh, you know, why why am I five foot ten uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, two foot six? I guess because because I because I'm a human being, uh, not and and not a uh, not a gremlin, right? If my if my race was gremlin and I was I, I was two foot six, you'd say, well, race was the, deter you know, I'm I'm half German, I'm half Jewish. I don't know which half to hate more. Right? Like, is it is it a, a determinant of, of human traits and capacities? Again, you have to define these words within the definition to come to an understanding of it. So, is is it the primary determinant? Like, in and of itself, this part of the definition it becomes kind of meaningless, right? Racial differences, and the second part of the definition, racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race. Now, this is where I'm like, I'm a fan of race realism. And so, oh, well, that makes you racist, Adam. Oh, okay, <laughs> whatever definition you want to impose here. Like, let's, look, we can use science and studies and, and we can observe that there, there are 
you know, different ethnic breakdowns, races within the human race, and go, well, some of them have different features than others. And I, you know, it's Walter Block, I, I love him, you know, with his breakdown and saying, well, you know, we see according to these statistics, you know, Jewish people on average have the highest intelligence. And so when it comes to intelligence, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Jewish superior whatever like yeah okay i believe in the superiority of the Jew when it comes to athletics we say okay black americans tend to tend to be more athletic and we see that you know in in, in racial breakdowns yes you have these different uh, I, I, things that, that go along with race and so is it superiority uh I, I think um i think the way that that walter block said it was when it comes to intelligence i'm a jewish supremacist when it comes to athleticism I'm a black supremacist. And and Walter Block is not a mean-spirited man in any way. He's the, one of the most loving professors that I know. And, and he is able to break down these third rail topics coming from a place of intellect and just accept that people are going to hate him for anything he says on the topic, right? And this is why I, I just, I'm a fan of Carlos Mencia's kind of humor on this. You know, you can make fun of people for their racial differences out of a spirit of love and respect and say, Hey, people of different races are different. And you know, they're going to be, if you, if you, and every, you know, you people want to say, well, okay, Adam, I can, I can recognize that, that there are differences between races, but I am not a racist because I don't believe in the superiority of a race. Really? Well, I mean, do, do you have, do you have sexual preferences? I'm pretty sure every human being does. Right. You know, you, you, you do you date people of, a, of, of certain traits that trend towards ethnicity? I mean, I can prove that you have an inherent belief of the superiority of a particular race when it comes to satisfying your sexual desires. And you go, well, the, the, geez, the term becomes really meaningless now. It's really stupid. Right? Now, so there's some other definitions that deserve examination here. A doctrine or political program based on the assumption of racism and designed to execute its principles or be a political or social system founded on racism. Now, this is like when I hear the term like systemic racism, you know, I I am, am happy to admit, yeah, there is there is systemic racism. There is a there is a kind like if you want to accept all of these racial constructs and and you can for the purposes of examining and understanding certain topics is there is there a white privilege in the united states oh yeah oh yeah and is it is it really uh, appropriate to call it that i don't know i don't care you know you want to examine racial issues calling something white privilege i mean it's something i've experienced uh as a half white guy wait i'm sorry half german half jewish are either of those white? Can we break down white? Is I mean, you, you talk about like the, the white race, and right away, you, you, your whole construct kind of starts to fall apart, right? We uh, white privilege is white privilege a thing? Is systemic racism a thing? Well, to the extent that if you're white in America, you don't experience the disadvantages that people who are not white experience, right? Is that is that a privilege? Is that is that an advantage? Yeah, of course it is. Now, of course, this term is abused and used in all sorts of nefarious political ways to actually support racist systems that have a political, like to, to create a system based on, you know, a kind of racial judgment of, of superiority or inferiority. And when, when I hear like, well, the, the, the system is racist, like, eh, I thought racism was a belief. Are, are we anthropomorphizing the system now? But okay, you want to say that a system is founded on racism, founded on a belief. Yeah, well, no, even when, when, when you actually put it in those terms, there really is, in, unless it's actually codified in the system, there, there's kind of no such thing as systemic racism. Now, the system that we have today of arbitrary authority in the police state clearly allows for the expression of racism if you're if you're a racist police officer right and you won't abuse that authority your biases are going to be expressed in how you exercise your authority as a cop now here's the problem definition three of racism racial prejudice or discrimination now 
liberals attempting to use racism as a weaponized term. I think jump the shark is almost too mild a term to describe what has happened to the term racism. Because now with Miriam Webster, we see definition three, racial prejudice or discrimination. Well, that's got to be everybody, right? Everybody is going to, at some point in their lives, express or have racial prejudice or discrimination, right? And it doesn't have to be hateful. It can be completely benign. Let me give you an example. And this is, Jim, you're, you're part Native American, right? And, and you're, I mean, you pass for white for most, for most intense. You've enjoyed white privilege, right? But you're, you're a little darker. You got to get a little, get a little skin tone. You got a little extra, a little more melanin than, than myself. Uh, and, and so you, do, do you use sunblock when we're outside working here? No, he's shaking his head like never, right? Never. I've never seen you. Now, do I put on sunblock? I'm not a fan. I like to, the cover up strategy, you know, be a little more, but you know, if I had to be out and exposed, yeah, I put a little sunblock on my face, maybe my arms. Now, if I was at an event passing out sunblock, I would be exhibiting some pretty serious racism in terms of racial prejudice and discrimination. Cause I'm not going to go to gym or a black dude first and go, Hey man, you need some SPF hundred. looks like you're frying out here. No, I'm going to go with Jim Gaffigan and his pasty kids who he makes fun of saying you're, you know, you, <laughs> you know, we're going to put on, we're going to go out this weekend. Well, better start, you know, oiling them up with sunblock now because they're all pale and pasty and will burn in five minutes. So yeah, I'm going to have, I'm, I'm going to be discriminatory, right? You want to, you want to do, this is, this, we can go the other way with this and so many other examples like, Hey, sickle cell anemia, not a thing with white people, kind of a thing with black people. If you're going to study sickle cell anemia, you're going to want to exhibit some racial prejudice or discrimination in who you include in your test cases and in your studies. Right. So now back to Donald Trump, the, the, the question of is Donald Trump himself racist? Now, th there's some, you know, pretty, pretty scary quotes from Donald Trump o over the years. You know, um, we, we've heard, you know, it, 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 and a lot of this is sort of like alleged off the record. You know, so the, the, one of the quotes that, that we've heard um, supposedly with tr from Trump. It, from the early 90s is besides that i tell you something else i think that guy's lazy and it's probably not his fault because laziness is a trait in blacks now this is this is like in and of itself it's a really confounding statement right in light of all of this intellectual explanation of like what is racism it's like you know what to look at a black guy and say or, or to look at a look at a pasty white guy and say look he burned but don't worry, you know, it's because he's, he's pasty and white. I don't think it's his fault, though. He's Irish. <laughs> like, wait, wait, is this racism or anti-racism? I can't tell. He's trying to say, no, no. can an honest person who has no hate in their heart say, no, I want to look at, I want to look at racial difference. I want to understand racism. I want to understand human ethnicities. I want to understand racial breakdowns and ethnic groups. I want to understand the human heritage, and they discover, hey, there are these traits that trend along ethnic groups. And then they go into the world without any prejudice against any individual. But when I meet an individual, then after this experience, after this study, I, I, I've got it, I've got this background, I've got this, you know, I've got these prejudices, right, that I might impose it or, or carry into my judgment of an individual. You know, if a white person uh, was beat up by a bunch of black people as a child, do you, is it his fault that when he sees black people, he's triggered by that trauma and is therefore going to be discriminatory against black people? Now, by the way, let's turn this one around for a second, shall we? If a black person was beat up by a bunch of white people, could you blame that black person for being triggered by seeing white people or having some prejudice? Now, if you want to look up like, has there been more black on white or white on black violence in American history? The answer is pretty overwhelmingly obvious if you just know anything about 
the history of American slavery, right? So, are, you know, and, and I've heard this before, like, are, are black people racist? And, you know, the, the SJWs want to come, oh, you can't be racist unless you're white. What friggin' twist of logic and words and definitions did you have to go through to come up with that statement, right? So, so you know, like, are, are black people racist or prejudiced against white people? Uh, if they are, I'd say that's a uh, that's that's uh that's understandable to say the least, right? You know, so this this thing about this question is Donald Trump racist? We're kind of asking for like an interior state, and you know, a sense a state of mind. Is someone racist? You know, I'd have to say anybody who who talks about race, anybody who examines race from a, a fair intellectual perspective. Uh, could be described as racist by any definition. That's why I, I don't really use the term. It's it's, I, I and I certainly never accuse any individual of being racist, right? I mean, I guess unless they're sort of self-identifying, and it's like, well, let me point out to someone like this person is an avowed racist, like, and by this definition of what it means to them. But as a word, like, it's become so pointless and useless to say it's it's racist. So what are what are, when 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 I as a libertarian look at problems around race, what what's the real problem? Like what when I say because I've said this right there, problem. Like why are we at, even asking this question? Is Donald Trump racist? Why is it relevant? Because we do have problems around race and race relations in the United States in the world. This is still an issue. And I'm not here to say, oh my God, racism is on the rise because look at Donald Trump. No, racism is on the decline. I mean, Joe Biden came out and said that. Donald Trump is our first racist president the other day. Really? George Washington owned slaves. Abraham Lincoln said horrifically racist, horrifically demeaning things towards the black race as a whole. If anything, the general trend is for presidents to become less racist over time along with the rest of society. Now, it's hard when we had our first half black American president right before Donald Trump to be like, well, is Donald Trump? Because I want to say, you know, when people say Donald Trump is the worst president we've ever had, it's actually, a, yeah, he's probably the best we've ever had. Now, for all the things that, yeah, yeah, bear with me here, right? For all the things I have to say about Trump by my assessment of ethics, um, yeah, he's probably the best president we've ever had. Because there's been a decline in statism. There's been a decline in the viciousness and violence of government over time. Now, this would be, I guess, ignoring the coronavirus shutdowns and the response by the federal government to the George Floyd protests and riots. Remember, for all the forced unemployment crisis that we're experiencing right now, the economic calamity, we're talking about a virus with a lower mortality rate than trying to spend a counterfeit $20 bill in Minneapolis as the excuse, right? So what is what is the, uh, you know, real assessment of Donald Trump as a president? Right now, it's pretty shitty. You know, in, in terms of the, the, the increase in government power, the disregard for individual rights, the increase in violence. Is there a racial component to this in the sense that Black people, Black Americans, other minorities are being disproportionately disadvantaged by this? Because, you know, they uh, you know, we see that the, the, the unemployment right now is higher among minorities because they are more likely to have the kind of jobs that are shut down right now, bars, restaurants, service industry type stuff, right? So but is, is the policy racist? Is Donald, does this make Donald Trump racist because he declared a state of emergency that led to policy that disadvantaged black people disproportionately? Of course not. But that gets us to a more important point about Donald Trump, what the real problem is here, right? Because it's not you know, it, racism itself, that's a problem. And I'll, I'll explain this, right? as, a, as a belief system. You know, racial prejudice or discrimination, it, even that isn't necessarily the problem, right? Like I said, I'm going to be discriminatory in who I help with my sickle cell anemia research. I'm going to be discriminatory in who I pass out free sunblock to at a public event or, who, you know, obviously... Even that's not the problem. So when people say racism, we're like, what do they really mean when they're saying racism is bad? 
because now we we see all sorts of crazy definitions. It's it's is it racial hatred? Is it racial discrimination? Is it is it bias in in actual policy and decision making? Because look, I would rather have someone be racist than be an a hole, right? I mean, like you can't like if someone is is actually like racist in in a way where they 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 have a, a, a view of an inferiority of a, of, of a race based on some statistics or personal experience. You, you can, you can fix that. You can like educate people out of that, which you can't fix is someone being an asshole. And I would rather have a world full of open, acknowledged, self-avowed racists than a world of assholes. Let me, let me, let me explain, right? Like you can, you can say, Hey, I'm a racist. I believe in the superiority of the white race. And, and I think because, because on the whole, you know, we're not as smart as Jews, but, you know, we're we're better looking and, and we're, we're more intelligent on average. And if you look at the history of Western civilization, you know, and and for what I'm a tra- I like white chicks. So, you know, like I'm, I, I think you know, white people are superior. I believe in the superior of the white race. But you know what? I don't I don't hate anybody. You know, like I, I, I look when I look down on people for whatever reason, I do so with kindness and compassion and love and empathy. Like I just because I know that I'm. I'm white and I'm financially secure and I'm relatively smart. And, and I, if I see a black person and I go, well, you know, you might be poor, but you know what? I love you as a human being and I want to lift you up. And, you know, think about it. What, what isn't, isn't that, wouldn't that be better than someone who says, well, I hate poor people. So I don't care if you kill them. Cause that's a lot closer to what Donald Trump is. Right. So. The terms that we use are really important here. And and when people say that Donald Trump is a racist, it seems that it's a lot more appropriate to describe him as a bigot, right? Now, definition of a bigot. Thank you, CJ. Let's get that definition up there. A person who is obstinately or intolerantly devoted to his or her own opinions and prejudices especially one who regards or treats members of a group such as a racial or ethnic group with hatred or intolerance. Now, the definition says it could be a racial or ethnic group, but not necessarily. I mean, I could be a bigot towards short people. I could be a bigot towards tall people. I could be a bigot towards people with long, scraggly beards who look like Charles Manson, like like my co-host Jim Freedom here, right? I could be a bigot against, uh, you know, against people in the military because they're signing up to to kill for politicians. You know, I I, I could be, uh, but but you know, even then, you know, now we can say that bigotry is inherently a bad thing, right? Being obstinate or intolerant in your devotion to your opinions and prejudices. Yeah, there, there is a kind. Yeah, we can say that that's a bad thing unequivocally in any circumstances. To be closed-minded, right? But even that really doesn't sum up the problem with Donald Trump. Because this idea of a bigot really applies to a lot of politicians, right? I mean, uh, anybody who says, well, no, the state is good no matter what. Government is good and righteous and necessary. And, you know, red team go, blue team go. We have to have socialism at any cost, whether it's Republican socialism or Democrat socialism. And if you, and and again, regarding people because they're members of a group with hatred and intolerance. Now, again, we're talking about an internal state, right? Is Donald Trump a bigot? Again, I don't really care. I, I, I don't, what is his internal state, right? I mean, if, like, let's, again, you know, could, could we, could we come up with an idea for a benign bigot? Right, you know, maybe it's someone who's just really dumb. Right? Maybe they had brain damage, right? And or maybe they've had some trauma again that leads them to be triggered when they see members of a group, right? If you've been like you've had some some violent experience with people of an ethnic group different from yours, you might then have a triggering experience that that leads you to treat members of that group with hatred and intolerance, right? And this would be understandable. If if you were beaten, if you're a white guy, you got beaten up by by black kids as a kid all the time, and you you don't you maybe you're not conscientious of what's going on. Even you're not even aware, but you see black people 
you have a trigger of hatred and intolerance. But because you are at core a caring, compassionate person, you put your you put that negativity in check. And you're aware and you go, you know what? Hey, I'm not going to treat an individual with anything other than love and respect, despite the hatred and intolerance that I feel for them. I mean, I guess you could be a bigot and still outwardly treat everybody with love and respect, even if you regard them with hatred and intolerance. So what's the real problem with Donald Trump in all of this? What, what do I care? Why do I condemn Donald Trump? Because I, I can say right now, he's not a racist. He's not a bigot. Or at least I don't know. And really, when it comes down to it, I don't care because I can't read his mind and I'm going to judge him by his actions, not by his words, and not by my assumptions or guesses about what his internal thought process is or what his state is. I mean, if, 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 you, if you really examine Donald Trump's actions and words, I mean, you've got to think, like, what is it that really motivates him? You know, his, his mind seems to operate from a, 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 a purely egocentric perspective, right? Everything he, he gets, all the information that he processes seems to be received as, is it, does, it, does it benefit me or does it not benefit me? And when you have a president who does that, well, yeah, I mean, you give power to any bit individual who does that, you're going to have a bad time. So what's my problem with Donald Trump? He is a violent statist who regularly enacts, supports, and oversees policies that violate individual rights. Does he do it out of hatred? I don't know. Does he do it out of racism? I don't really care. But what is the effect? The president of the United States is a violent status who has no respect for individual rights. This man right here, Donald Trump, possibly your president, is willing to use the violence of government against you as an individual. He is a criminal. That should be enough to condemn him without labeling him with these sloppy terms like bigot or racist or any other virtue signaling nonsense that means almost nothing upon examination. There are enough real crimes for which to condemn President Donald Trump. And today is Friday, July 24th, 2020. Man, that was fun, but that took too long. Yeah, I don't really care. I think my point was clear enough. A lot of fun examples in there. I was just off the top of my head. Not, Geez, I, is it my racial? I'm not a midget. It's my race. Sorry. Why, why, do, why, do I, why am I a racist towards Jim? Because he's a Native American, in part. Yeah, that's why I hate myself, because I'm half Jew. Comment Jim Freedom, ladies and gentlemen, in studio today. Sitting over there, but I'm pointing to him by pointing at my fridge right now. Jim, um, that that was. Uh, I, I hope I can kind of like put this one to rest now. You've heard some. I've, I've some of those lines. I, this that's the third time I've sung that song on the air. I promise I won't do it again. I got I got my all of my thoughts on racism and Donald Trump out of my system. Is the audience happy, or do we have triggered Donald Trump supporters? Uh, well, I feel like you nailed it, but I've been keeping the chat here so that we can start with our super chat first. All right, we got a super chat today. Ben Hickman, four ninety nine, enacting policies that disproportionately affect people of color, as Trump has, makes you at the very least passively racist. Sure, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, callous to to the to the plight of of people by race. 
Yeah. So, but, but even then, Ben, you know, I would challenge you like passively racist. What, what does that even mean? You know, can you be passively racist? So uh, this is why I get, I think this term in and of itself, like, what does it come to mean? Bad feelings, bad beliefs about racism or about races. Like, that's all it means. Does Donald Trump, so like, do you passively have, I don't know if that's possible. But what you're pointing out, Ben, see, I so I I want I want to use more accurate language to describe this. What does it really mean that Donald Trump enacts these policies that disproportionately disproportionately you know, disadvantage or hurt people uh, based on race? That just makes him a callous asshole, you know. Like, if, 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 hey, like I, I there's a policy that makes this race bad or that race bad or that race you know experience bad things. I don't think that implies that I'm a racist, right? That implies just that I'm a callous asshole. I don't I, that that I'm un, unsympathetic, uncaring. That I don't I don't I don't care about the suffering of others. To me, the race is irrelevant. Like if, if I'm if I'm Donald Trump, I'm president, and I'm I'm signing off on a policy one that hurts black people, right? And then I sign off on other people another another policy that hurts uh, Asians, and then I sign off on a policy that hurts poor people. And then I sign off on a policy that, that hurts immigrants. And I don't care about any of those frickers. Like, yeah, of course. I'm, is it because I'm, am, am I passively racist? I don't, I don't think you can say that. I, you know, I think the term, again, even there, loses meaning. And this, you know, throwing around the accusation of, of racism makes it harder to address the real problems that we're trying to talk about. All right. We've got to have some other comments. on. Tell me, please tell me we triggered some. Trump supporters and the I, I don't know maybe I was defending Trump too much. I hope that wasn't the impression I was giving here. Gray State likes the term passive racism. Passive racism? Uh, no, uh, see that's. I like what Andre said. Uh, uh, Trump used to be funny. LOL. Not that it's a joke anymore. We aren't the global leaders economically or with trade anymore. We have lost allies. We are so beyond racist. Yeah. Oh man. See, this is what I forgot to bring up in the uh, in, in in that rant. Although again, again, I think it was long enough. Is it like you could be a bigot based on nationalism? You hate people because they're not born within your country. Like that's so much worse. And I think that's uh, you know really a, a worse feature of Trump's bigotry, if you will. But even there, I don't want to. You know, it's sort of speculative. Now, do I do I want to understand how Trump thinks? Kind of like, do I really care if I can, you know, educate people to bigger issues in a way that would lead us to behavior that stops government as a whole by, you know, opting out of the system by practicing agorism? Anyway, yeah, I see, I really screwed up there. I didn't include the bigotry of nationalism in my rant. Uh, so, yeah, hey, we've got an exciting guest queued up today. Mark Victor is going to be joining us in just 24 minutes. And we are very excited to be talking to this attorney for freedom from Arizona, especially with the cases that he's been dealing with recently under the coronavirus pandemic. But it was actually from him because I'm I'm subscribed to his email list. There's not a lot of email lists that I, I actually read on a regular basis, but Mark Victor's, I at least I see all of his emails. He does he does some really cool legal work. And actually today what he sent us was the uh, big holes in the COVID spike narrative uh, with Ron is Ron Paul's weekly column for this week. Really cool for pointing out, uh, well, just lies, lies, and more statistics. Before we get to our headlines today, we've got, uh, you know, we've got, of course, our coronavirus updates. This is a really important one, though. Big holes in the COVID spike narrative. Uh, and we're going to take some callers, right? Caller number five today. So we're going to do a story, take a caller, do a, do a story, take a caller, uh, do a story, take a guest. Caller number five today wins membership in the Anna vs. the Man Producers Club. So, Jim, can you get that link out to uh, to all of our destinations? Anybody can click on this StreamYard link. And if you are caller number five today, you will win membership in our $10 tier for patrons. Uh, the good ones. Those are, no, those are the better ones. We have OK, Good, Better, and Best. And CJ, I, I don't know if you want to, do, CJ, do we want to do a producer's note and announce what's going on with, uh, with, with, with the change in format or should we wait until Monday to roll that out? 
and just say we're we're on pause for right now. I'll just say I guess if, unless CJ is not jumping on, so I'm gonna say maybe maybe we'll just okay there he is. You know we can just wait till Monday and say we've got some exciting new announcements about what we're doing with it. CJ figured out some really cool ways that we can broadcast this show live with um, Adam versus the man.com with our own destination and have a censorship free space that doesn't even depend on Patreon. By the way, another producer note for today, everybody enjoying our better quality audio with our new studio mic. Yeah. Yeah. The, no complaints or any compliments in the in the comments today. CJ, what do you want to say? Anything about our upcoming potential format shift? So I, I do want to make it known that the, the, the shift isn't to take away anything from anyone that signs up for Patreon. Patreon is still the exclusive spot where we cater to those that financially support our broadcast. Now, what we're going to do is still maintain a public show through the website that is already available. And that'll also add a donation link to where uh, we keep 100% of your donation versus uh, the 30% cut from, from Google. So uh, the other uh, thing is, is that you'll still be able to watch the show live, but only on Patreon or on our website where we can at least track the analytics for it. And then the other thing is that uh, we will have a new bar put up at top, maybe a, a new design, new graphics, new intro. Uh, it, it helps us evolve this from the, dare I say, brick wall mortar pestle that we've built already as our foundation and allows us to give you a visual experience that is more streamlined, integrated, um, I do have a degree in, in integrating softwares and trying to get the maximum out. And some softwares provide this benefit. Some softwares provide that benefit. And to wrap it up in short, uh, we want to give everybody the best experience. The ones that will be able to chat with us live, like you see now where we generate all these chats Jim throws up or we use to discuss, uh, the dollar will become your ability to chat. And and uh, and that that opens it up to uh, then, you know, the higher levels for Patreon interaction. But what it does is it still lets us be censorship free because it's out on your website and it allows us to be censorship free to our patrons. So that means that starting on August 1st, we don't have to worry about the algorithms, so to speak. So. Uh, or the the censorship. Now the clips for the daily show that we take out regularly, uh, they will still be shared and uploaded onto YouTube. So if you're a YouTube subscriber, you're still gonna be able to see the daily clips. Uh, you're just not gonna be able to be watching from YouTube anymore. Well, we're taking that away from Google as well. Uh, we're just utilizing them as a middle person conduit for the tech. I mean, if I could eliminate that bridge, I would. But unfortunately, I can't and still get both my ways. Now, downside, and I'd be open to hearing the, the conversation, we may lose the ability to display comments on the screen. Now, this is the only downside to the current setup. I'm working with StreamYard. I've been in chats with them. I, I, every, I, I type out my issues. They're very responsive and receptive to hearing me out. Um, but uh, right now, my current situation is, is I've got two mail-ins, and I'm trying to plug them in together. And if I could just get a male and a female <laughs> in, then uh, I'd be I'd be just fine. But uh, that's the only limit I got. But it's to enhance the experience of the audience in a way that eliminates the contentious drama of social media chats, and 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 it fosters a educated conversation of people that care enough to at least invest a dollar in what you're watching. I mean, it's, it's almost as simple as that. And it'll weed out a lot of uh, disinformation or, or dare we say trolls in the comments. So a big producer notes coming, I'd say um, we can roll this out in phases, but we will be ready to launch by the time we are patrons only. So that's pretty much what I got, sir. Awesome. Yeah, really excited about this format shift um, and looking to bring you a better show. You know, I'm trying to play. I keep getting disconnected 
on uh, on Streamyard here on on my laptop, trying to see the comments. But I, I wanted to show. I want. There's actually something here that uh, that that I wanted to respond to. Uh, let's see. There's another comment. So you gotta you gotta give me these um these real thought provoking comments and questions. Dylan Johnson. So in our comments today, Dylan Johnson writes, Adam, what do you call people who are nationalists but with ideas instead of a nation? Now, Dylan, thank you for raising this question because it's an important point that I forgot to make about Donald Trump's bigotry. Now, this is something where I'm not just guessing about his internal state. I'm going based on his statements. When he says things like, well, shithole country. Uh, I hope that doesn't trigger the YouTube censors too much. But when he says things like shithole countries, and oh, well, look, look, Africa's full of shithole countries. Is he being racist or is he being a nationalist? Like, right, does he does he hate those people or is he does he feel disdain or prejudice against them because they're black or because they live in a different country? And I think that kind of nationalism is more dangerous than racism. Yes, there have been, at least right now, right? Yeah, there have been wars over, you know, human history fought based on race. And racism is an incredibly important part of war. Because in order to get a human being to kill another human being, you have to dehumanize the enemy. And this was something that, you know, CJ and I experienced in deployment to Iraq, where I I won't even repeat all terms that are, you know, substituted for haji. But that kind of dehumanization of the enemy is necessary. But today, it's harder to get away with that. But it's still easy and generally publicly acceptable to get away with discrimination or prejudice and bigotry based on nations, right? I mean, even Donald Trump talking about China, the Wuhan virus, the Kung flu, you know, and, and say, well, we're going to limit travel, you know, for, for anybody from Asia who they, they sent it over here. The, the virus, right? So nationalism is is really the current most dangerous form of bigotry. And to, to the question, you know, what about with with ideas instead of instead of actual nations? Yeah, absolutely, just as dangerous when it's anything other than libertarianism. Because anything, I mean, libertarianism is nonviolence as a political philosophy, which makes it stand in stark contrast with every other political philosophy, which is some form of violence against individuals that is a violation of their rights through the state, through government. So yeah, Donald Trump in that sense is a much more dangerous bigot because of his nationalism than racism and or, or you know any other prejudice that he might have. So yes, thank you for that question. And, and as a follow-up, it is very important to point out that nationalism is a, a very dangerous form of bigotry as well. And what that leads to is not just dangerous policy from governments, but judging individuals and treating individuals differently based on where they were born, what uh, government racket they were subject to upon birth. And, and that is a, a very uh, dangerous kind of bigotry. So Jim, any other hot, co you know what, no more comments. We're gonna cover our next. Oh, you got one, one that's burning. You got to pop up here. If kung flu is racist, what about yellow fever? Is that, is that the same? If name? kung flu is racist, well, see, I'm not saying that. I don't think kung flu is racist. Kung flu is nationalist, and it, it is sort of like you know anti-nationals. Right? We don't have a term for. You know, when we say racism, you know, we def we have to sometimes define it as superiority of a race. But the way it's used is more to describe inferiority of other races. So like nationalism to describe the inferiority of other nations. Yeah, I think I think that's fair. Um, but is, is it racist? No, is this, you know, they, when I say when when Trump says it's the China virus because it, it jokingly calls it the Kung flu. I think what you're doing is a kind of racism or, or, or at least exhibiting a racial bias, because what, what you're doing is you're assuming that. Everybody in China is ethnically Chinese. What about the the Uyghurs? What about uh, all of the uh, the expats from other countries who live in China who, are, who aren't Chinese? What about the Tibetans? 
right? No, so what, 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 when you say Trump, actually what you're doing, when you say Trump is racist because he said bad things about Chinese people, because he said bad things about the Chinese nation, you are actually making an assumption that is inherently racist and dismissive of the, the racial diversity of the nation of China. So there, ah, we can turn these terms around on anybody. All right. So our first headline, this is an important one from the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity, big holes in the COVID spike narrative. Motor, motorcycle accidents ruled COVID deaths in the rush to paint Florida as the epicenter of the second wave of the coronavirus outbreak. Government officials and their allies in the mainstream media have stooped to ridiculous depths to maximize the death count. A television station this weekend looked into two highly unusual COVID deaths among victims in their 20s. And when they asked about comorbidities, they were told one victim had none because his COVID death came in the form of a fatal motorcycle accident. Sadly, this is not an isolated incident. In fact, the spike that has dominated the mainstream for the last couple of weeks is full of examples of such trickery. Washington State last week revised its COVID death numbers downward when it was revealed that anyone who passed away for any reason whatsoever who also had coronavirus was listed as a COVID-19 death, even if the cause of death had nothing to do with COVID-19. And I, I got to say, thank you, Dr. Paul, for this just matter of fact explanation of what I've been ranting about for weeks since we got these first reports of false COVID death, since we've had this obvious manipulation of the data used to justify violation of individual rights. And I, I really get sick of pointing this out, but it's worth reminding people that 86.59348792513 of all statistics are total made up bullshit designed to manipulate you. And none of them even justify, in this case, the policy that they're advocating for with this. Oh, well, because of these statistics, uh, we should steal $1,000 from you if you don't wear a mask in public. And if it wasn't enough to, to see that the, the numbers themselves are nonsense, if, if you can't look at this intellectually the way that Ron Paul does and, and, and say, well, you know, we, we understand that this is nonsense. Just look at the people who are telling you this. Let's go to Breitbart.com for a second. Critics taunt Dr. Anthony Fauci for watching baseball game without a mask. And, it, you know, this is this is funny. Breitbart kind of, you know, burying the lead here. It's not that he's getting taunted. Like, that's not the story here. The story is that he went and sat there with his mask around his chin, laughing, sitting next to two people with masks. I mean, like, what is this? Hey, Dr. Fauci. You're giving those grandmas COVID and you're killing them because you're not wearing your mask properly and you're not distancing around other people. And you went and you throw the fr now, this is so funny. Now, think uh, Dr. Fauci was invited by the Nationals to throw out the first pitch before the National Yankees game, where, by the way, every single player kneeled before the national anthem and there were no fans allowed. And now, by the way, Fox Sports is going to fill empty baseball stadiums with virtual fans. This is where this is all going. It's not just that we're being bullied and pushed into hazmat suit world where like, hey, if you want to come out and do anything, you got to wear a mask and, and wear a hazmat suit. They're actually trying to get people to shift their lifestyles to just be at home all the time. See, there you go, empty stadium seats. And yet, if you look at the online, uh, you know, the, the, the announcement from... Fox Sports, they're going to have virtual, but yeah, now Jim is laughing because you're, what, you watch the actual pitch? <laughs> yeah. Like, if, if you're, I mean, yeah, it's funny. You know, it's a fun tradition to throw out the first pitch. If you're, if you're going to embarrass yourself, stay home. But, you know, and I'm not, I'm not here to make, okay, okay Jim's laughing. Like, Jim, you really shouldn't laugh at Dr. Fauci or make fun of him because he's an idiot who doesn't know his own physical body's capabilities and can't, you know, get, get like, yeah, the pitch was embarrassing. But no, what should we be making fun of him for? 
that he's revealing himself as an absurd hypocrite. And, you know, it's not just the, you know, implications for the, the rest of America. You know, let's, let's go jumping ahead to, to MSN.com from the New York Times. Trump abruptly cancels a Republican convention in Jacksonville. It's not the right time. Bowing to threats posed by the coronavirus, President Trump reversed course on Thursday and canceled the portion of the Republican National Convention to be held in Jacksonville, Florida, just weeks after he moved the event from North Carolina because state officials wanted the party to take health precautions there. Bowing to threats posed by the coronavirus. No, bowing to public pressure, bowing to the mainstream media. I mean, this is this is your president, all you Trumpa Loompas. Bowing to the press. Like, oh, yes. We support Trump because he pisses off the liberals. And then he licks their boots and does exactly what they say. Walks right into their coronaphobia trap instead of resisting it. Oh, I can declare a national state of emergency and have press conferences every day. People will listen to me and think I'm cool again. Oh, and then Trump is revealed to be the idiot here because he has fallen for Dr. Fauci's propaganda. And I think this is, you know, This is a trap that the Democrats set for the Republicans or set for Trump, right? And he walked right into it. So back to the the, the Fauci first pitch story, right? He was invited by the Nationals to throw out the first pitch to recognize, this is from Breitbart, the team invited Dr. Fauci to recognize his efforts in fighting the coronavirus pandemic which significantly shortened the baseball season and threatened to cancel it altogether. You know, and I tried to think of a metaphor to, or an analogy to help understand this, but it's like, hey, Dr. Fauci, because you're doing such a good job helping everybody fight the coronavirus, let's invite you to do something contrary to your advice that we're praising you for. You know, I I guess, I mean, it's kind of like, inviting an anti-masturbation activist to a circle jerk and then seeing them enthusiastically participate. Hey, you're doing such a good job stopping people from jerking off. You want to jerk off on this cookie with us and then we're all going to eat it? Like, yeah, really? Like, I mean, I could get more graphic and gross with this, but none of what I could possibly come up with as a metaphor would capture how disgusting The present reality we are experiencing is because of hypocrites like Dr. Anthony Fauci now revealing himself unqualifyingly, unquestionably as a hypocrite who doesn't believe his own bullshit. Back to Ron Paul here. In South Carolina, the state health agency admitted that the spike in COVID deaths was only the result of delayed reporting of suspected COVID deaths. An analysis reported daily COVID deaths last week compared to actual day of death in Houston revealed that the recent spike consisted largely of deaths that occurred in April through June. Why delay reporting until now? Ron Paul so benignly asks in his, I am not doing the Ron Paul voice. We do know that based on this spike, the Democrat mayor of Houston canceled the convention of the Texas Republican Party. Mission accomplished? Yeah, mission accomplished. Exactly, Dr. Paul. This is why they're doing all of this. And I, you know, this is where like, I hate to say I told you so, but I told you so again. What what did I say, Jim, about, do you know what I'm talking about here? You know, which I told you so. I told you that once we, once we let them use statistics like this as the excuse to violate individual rights, and they're going to do it again and again and again, How long are they going to get away with it with Corona? I don't know. But this means they could use it for the next crisis, the next funky off-season flu that's a normal occurrence in the global human family Petri dish. Doesn't it seem suspicious that so many states have experienced delayed reporting of deaths until Fauci and his gang of experts announced that we are in a new nightmare scenario? Last week in Florida, which is perhaps not coincidentally the location of the Republican Party's national convention, another scandal emerged when hundreds of COVID test centers reported 100% positive results. Obviously, this would paint a far grimmer picture of the resurgence of the virus. Orlando Health, for example, reported a positivity rate of 98%, a shocking level. 
but a further investigation revealed a true positivity rate of only 9.4%. Those anomalies were repeated throughout the state. Cases once meant individuals who displayed sufficient symptoms to be treated in medical facilities, but when the scaremongers needed a second wave, they began reporting any positive test result as a COVID case. No wonder we have a spike. Politics demands that politicians be seen doing something rather than doing nothing, even if that something is more harmful than nothing at all. That is why Washington is so addicted to sanctions. Okay, now Ron Paul is going, well, wait, sanctions? Why are you bringing sanctions into this? Well, it makes perfect sense for Ron Paul to bring this in as an example, for which I will bring in another example, 9-11 and the global war of terror. Regardless of what you thought happened on 9-11, and all we can really say for certain is that the government story is absolute nonsense, it still didn't justify invading Iraq and Afghanistan and occupying those countries for decades. Right. And they got this is it's shocking that government can't fabricate even better excuses for what they're like. Hey, there's a virus that's a threat. Well, first of all, it's not any kind of special threat. It's not. And, and, and while you're debating that, they're going, well, so how much of an excuse can we use this uh, or how much bad policy can we use this as an excuse for to violate your rights to enrich our sponsors, to keep the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer? and us in government getting more powerful. Well, I mean, it's the same thing. They use these excuses for sanctions, right? Well, there's this problem, Well, we're going to do something about sanctions. Don't make anything better. It's stealing from the poorest of people who are going to pay the brunt of the taxes, which sanctions represent, or just completely cutting off trade, as sometimes sanctions are with embargoes, which is basically say that you can't have trade between countries. That's an act of war. This, you are physically interfering with individuals' right to trade freely. And even now, with the, the trade war escalating between the United States and China, well, it looks like they're doing something. What is the result of this? The rich get richer, the poor get poor. Who pays for these tariffs in the trade war? They get passed on to consumers. It's not the rich who are paying for the cost of statism. They are profiting from it, however. Same as with the coronavirus. The same has been said, excuse me, the same has been true, especially in Republican controlled states in the U.S. in response to the coronavirus, faced with a virus that has killed about one third as many people as the normal seasonal flu virus in 2018. Texas Governor Greg Abbott has endorsed a partial shutdown of the economy, resulting in millions tossed into the despair of unemployment. Then he arbitrarily shut down bars because massively increased testing showed more people have been exposed to the virus, and he mandated that people wear face masks, neither shutting down bars instead of restaurants or Walmarts, nor forcing people to wear masks will have any effect on the progression of the virus through society, but at least he looks like he's doing something. We are facing the greatest assault on our civil liberties in our lifetimes. The virus is real. But the government reaction is political and totalitarian. As it fall, falls apart, will more Americans start fighting for their liberty? I hope so. And I think as I would be asking everybody today, if government doesn't follow its own rules, why should I have to? If the hypocrisy is laid so bare, why should I have any faith in the system whatsoever? And the answer is you shouldn't. You should have faith in yourself and freedom and your family, your loved ones, your communities, and other people who are willing to stand up and do the right thing in the face of this ridiculous adversity that has now bullied most Americans into thinking that they have to wear their own slave muzzle just to go out and interact with their fellow Americans. It is a sad state of affairs we have fallen into. And as Ron Paul called it, the coronavirus hoax, I don't think that is an exaggeration at all. And now we see just another phase of the hoax with this Spike in deaths, spike in cases, with the second wave used to justify a second wave of tyranny that will last far longer than this virus. And now that we're a little bit over time, I guess we're gonna we're gonna the last part of the show. We're gonna take callers. As many of you, as soon as you get in Streamyard, boom, 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 we're gonna go to callers. But to now, for now, excuse me, we go to our guest, ladies and gentlemen. 
Mark Victor, attorney for freedom, joins us from here in our home state of Arizona. Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. So many things I could be asking you about. You've been involved in a lot of cases recently here in Arizona of people challenging the shutdowns. Uh, regular Adam versus Demand viewers know that we covered the story of you defending a restaurant owner who got charged because they didn't go out and force their patrons to not eat their takeout on the public patio outside. I mean, there's so much absurdity we could get into in this. I'm, I'm excited to hear you know, what you see on the legal front, but also to give you the chance to share with me and, and, and my audience whatever insight you think is most relevant. So Mark, um, as, as the attorney for freedom first, you know, what, what else do you think our audience should know about, about you, what you do, your law practice, and, and how it's relevant to what we're facing today? Well, hey, brother. Happy, uh, happy Friday. It's great to be on your show. I've really enjoyed listening to you uh, rant over the last half an hour. I loved every second of it. And, uh, you know, what really, what really struck me in the midst of everything you said, was the most important thing you said was the gem that was packed in there that I wish you said more and more of that we, you and I together as brothers fighting for freedom, we need to say more of this point here. When you made the point that libertarians are qualitatively different than every other political position for one reason and one reason alone, we stand against aggression. And that makes us different hugely different in every way from everyone else. It, we don't need to distinguish the difference between the Republicans and the Democrats, or even we should just say libertarians and non-libertarians. We're the crowd that thinks aggression is wrong. Everybody else doesn't agree with that. They think yeah. aggression is okay. And they're arguing about in what areas they should aggress against you. I don't want to get involved in that discussion. I'm not interested yeah. in whether I'm being aggressed at from the left or aggressed at from the right. Okay, I have some little personal preferences here and there. Steal less of my money. Okay, that's better than stealing more of my money. Fine. We can <laughs> get into that. But if we want to change the world, we got to drill home and focus that point that you made, the point that we stand against aggression. And we need yes. to break it down for people because until we win that point, until that point gets across to our fellow brothers and sisters, we're gonna always be victims of aggression, whether we like it or not. So what I would love to do, and this is what I'm trying to do, and, and I want to work with you on this, man, because you and I are brothers. We've been fighting the fight for years. We could either get in the in the weeds of these little issues, which are still important issues, right? Like everything you've been talking about on coronavirus, um, it's a big issue. It's a big issue at this moment in time, right? We're going to look back at this probably next year. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, we're going to look at what's called all-cause mortality. We're going to say, how many dead bodies do we get every year? You know, we get about 3 million dead bodies every year in the United States. How many did we get last year? And you know what we're going to find? We already know what we're going to find, right? We're going to find, wow, we got about the same number of dead bodies that we've always had. That's the 7, number. 000, right. So I've been, I've been pointing this out as 7,000. Like, to put it in, uh, you're exactly right. And I've been waiting for the day that we have that irrefutable statistical analysis. And you're right, it might, now you see next year, I hope it's that soon, uh, but yeah, no, at some point you can't hide the data any longer. The, the number that I've been using to put it in perspective for, for my audience is that 7,500 Americans die every single day on average because we have 330 million something people and you go, oh my God, 100 people. Well, it's not. You just you have to have that perspective. So, Mark, just just for the bigger question, though, and and one of the things that because you raise this next year, you know, are we is, how how long is it going to take to flatten the curve of tyranny? How long are they going to be able to use this virus as the excuse? Look, whether it's this virus 
or the next virus or terrorism or the purity of milk or protection of children or who knows what. These, by the way, have always been the types of arguments, right? When, when you go to law school, you watch and see how they extended the Commerce Clause on arguments based about the purity of milk and this and that. There's always something to justify initiations of aggression. What I think we need to do is get to the 30,000 foot view. We need to seize this moment in time and say, look, we know that probably next year, we're gonna be able to look at the body count for 2020, right? And we're gonna say, look, it's not any different than 2019 or 2018 or 2017. And soon we'll be on to the next crisis, right? Because the American people have a very short attention span. And I think what we need to do is we need to fine tune our pitch about what you said about libertarians and what makes us qualitatively different. And as you know, and I wanna spend some more time talking with you about this so we can work together and cooperate. But as you know, I'm starting this new movement with a whole bunch of people, you included. Where do I live? You know uh, Mark, hold on, all right. Mark, I wanna, I wanna give you all the time to talk about live and let live and, and whatever cases you think are relevant to what's going on right now or anything else you want to promote. But I, I do want to, I really do want to get your opinion on, 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 on something a little more specific, really with what I asked here in terms of where things are going right now. Cause I've, I've talked about, you know, we do the, the, the curve, we got to flatten the curve and then you see the curve of tyranny, right? You see the increase in all these government policies. You see there, oh, there's a wave and it did kind of come down, right? We had a little period of, of sort of relief in some places as lockdowns were lifted. And now we're in the second wave and lockdowns are, are continuing. The mask mandates, they're going up. Governments are having at the state and local level more time to come up with draconian policies like we saw in Hidalgo County, Texas. Now, if you're uh, you know, exposed to someone who might have it, everybody in your household has to self-quarantine and follow these ridiculous demands. I want I want your opinion based on your understanding of the law and government policy and the cases that you've been dealing with. Where is where is this going now? Like, is it are we going to see more crackdowns in the next month? Are the current state of shutdowns and lockdowns and regulations are they going to last till the end of the year? Is it or is this going to taper off? Are we going to see schools reopening? Are legal challenges? to the shutdowns going to have some effect, like the kind of great work that you're doing. Like with even these mask mandates, when they say, you know, if you're in, in New York City, in, in public, we're gonna fine you $1,000 for not wearing, no, that's DC, excuse me. We're gonna fine you $1,000 for not wearing a mask. Can I say, well, I have a medical condition and my doctor said I shouldn't wear a mask, therefore this doesn't apply to me and I can just get out of it? Is there some other, are these even enforceable? Where is this going just in terms of the immediate future in the next few months? Well, I think that the level of tyranny, like the level of taxation, is always going to be at the level that the market will bear. OK, and at the moment uh, the market is bearing more tyranny. And the reason the market is bearing more tyranny at the moment is because a significant percentage of the population believes that we are dealing with a very serious crisis, a global pandemic that kills people in huge numbers and this, that, and the next thing. So as long as that's still the belief, then I think that the market that tolerates tyranny will tolerate more tyranny. I don't think this is gonna go on forever. I really don't. I think I am not in a crisis over the corona thing at all. I think we're in a moment in time right now I think that as we've seen virtually everywhere in the world, right? Corona comes, it goes through, there is a real thing called the coronavirus, right? And I don't think we should, I think we need to be very careful. Yeah, you can't say it doesn't exist, but it's a funky off season flu that's being blown ridiculously out of proportion. Yeah, I think that, look, what we have a real crisis of right now, and we have many other real crises as well, but one of the real crises we're dealing with is a crisis of information, right? Because if you watch CNN, then you believe the sky is falling and, and life may end over the coronavirus at any moment. If you watch Fox, you basically think this is all trumped up BS kind of thing. 
That's not to say that on the next issue, a Fox could be spouting the tyrannical position and CNN could have the freedom position. But what we don't know, and this is a real problem in the world right now as to many different issues, we don't have a set of facts. I mean, I could imagine, and you know, this is why sometimes, and I, I hope I don't come off the wrong way sounding like this, but sometimes I really enjoy talking to other lawyers because lawyers know how to use hypotheticals. We don't fight the hypothetical, right? So if I say, well, let's imagine a set of facts. Let's talk about it as a, a thought experiment. Let's imagine there's a real new virus that comes into the world and it's actually very deadly and it's actually very communicable and it's tearing through communities and it's actually killing lots of people. Okay, under those circumstances, we should be able to have a discussion about what should be the proper response to that kind of a circumstance. Now, whether you think that this is what we're dealing with now or not is a different question, but your belief about that affects your position right now is what I'm saying. I mean, just the simple fact about question about are masks effective against the coronavirus? Some people think absolutely the mask, even, a, even a, if I went like this, Adam, if I just went like this, this is effective against the coronavirus. Some people think that, right? And other people think no matter what mask you wear, it's not effective. So until we can get agreement on facts, we can't actually have a discussion about the issue. This is the exact same problem we have on many issues. For example, global warming. Some people think the earth is warming. Some people think it's cooling. Some people think it's caused by this or that. We don't have agreement on the facts. So in order to have an interesting discussion about these issues, you got to use the hypothetical. You have to say, okay, imagine as given facts, this, 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 and this. Now, what would be the proper, we might say, libertarian response to this kind of a situation? So stepping back from that for a moment, I can imagine that the world could have certain emergencies, right? There could be an emergency. Say, you know, a, a comet could strike the earth, creating a gigantic problem causing power outages and food shortages and this and that. Okay, that's an emergency. What should happen in an emergency? We should be able to have a discussion about that. And many of these state constitutions and state statutes try to address this by saying, okay, fine, if there's a real emergency, the governor gets to decide what that emergency is. So the governor has some discretion to say, number one, we got an emergency. And then number two, here's how we deal with that emergency. In a vacuum, you might say this kind of makes sense, right? Because the legislature is the branch that's supposed to make the laws. But if we're in a huge emergency and you can't get a bunch of knuckleheads who are elected to Congress or the state legislatures to get together in a room and have a debate, somebody's got to make decisions. So a lot of these, like, for example, in Hawaii, where I actually sued the governor, they, they say 60 days. The governor's got 60 days to figure out how to deal with the emergency. And that makes sense if you think about, okay, two months, the legislature should get together and we're back to the rule of law. What actually happened in Hawaii is the governor got to day 61 and said, well, I'm just going to extend it again. And we keep extending and extending and extending. And, you know, I'm doing later on, I'm going to do a discussion about these particular legal issues. And the only way to stop this stuff from happening is to convince somebody wearing a black robe, right? Somebody wearing a black robe has got to say, yes, I find that this violates the separation of powers doctrine or something like that. And at the moment, courts are not doing that. And the reason they're not doing that is mostly they're citing this case back from 1905, this Jacobson case that comes out of Massachusetts, which is actually a forced vaccination case where the Supreme Court in 1905 said, yes, uh, the government in Massachusetts has the constitutional authority to impose and force vaccinations on people to fight this other, I think it was smallpox at the time, to deal with it. So there's case precedent for that. Now, of course, uh, legal scholars know that because this case happened in 1905, it's pre a major shift we had in 1937 which was the biggest shift in constitutional law decision-making in the history of our country. We probably don't have time to go into it, but something happened in 37 connected to FDR's court packing scheme. 
It's how the New Deal got passed. Our Supreme Court was striking down the New Deal, and then they changed radically how they did business in 37. This is where the court let us down, and they started allowing this stuff. And we still are suffering from that decision in 37. It's one of the reasons that part of this movement, I'm, I'm, I'm going to propose a new constitutional amendment to basically get us back to the pre 37 days. Because imagine if the courts were acting differently right now. Imagine if we had the right people on the courts and they were saying, look, the governor doesn't have the power on day 61. Or they weighed out, and this is really what the court's supposed to be doing. Do we have a real emergency? What's the answer? Okay, so, 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 Mark, I, I want to I go back and kind of ask like two follow-up questions specifically, because what, what your, your answer to, you know, how long will this last being based on public opinion, like, yeah, the, the limits of tolerance are prescribed by the endurance of the oppressed. Absolutely. Brilliant answer by which to analyze this. But that begs a very important follow up question. When will that change in the public opinion? And I want to give you an example with my family. I'm going to tell you about my brother. I'm not going to name which one. I have three brothers. I'm not going to single them out by name here. But I, I have one brother who seems to have fallen pretty hard for the propaganda in believing that this virus is a real unique threat. And uh, I'm reminded of the you know, Mark Twain quote, which is which he probably never actually said, which is that it is easier to fool someone than to convince them that they have been fooled. And with my brother, I see even now, like, as I, I'm willing to admit that I was fooled. Like, I genuinely fell for the initial threat reports of what the virus was based on, what was it, the, the Princess cruise ship, where they yeah. said, look, we had, we had this isolated population, and, you know, 3% of them die. Therefore, it's, it's very deadly. It's six times as deadly as the flu. And, like, I fell for that. You know, now with that column that, that you shared with from Ron Paul, we see that the best assessment now is that it's only about one third as deadly as the flu. I'd like to take some pride in the fact that I'm willing to admit that I'm wrong. I'm open minded. I'm I'm happy to correct myself and to learn and say, what? Well, yep, yep, they tricked me. And I'm not going to I'm not going to continue to fall for that. But what Mark Twain's quote is really underscoring here is that once people have committed to an idea, even if it's based on lies and they were tricked into that, it's very hard to get them to change their mind. Is that happening? And then I don't know if you want sort of another follow up to this is in those legal challenges that you're a part of, are we going to be, uh, do we have enough of the right people on the bench that we are going to be able to push back in a meaningful way? I don't know. Um, we, you know, what we have now are Republicans and Democrats on the bench. So what that means is we've got everybody on the bench who's willing to initiate force. Uh, some are willing to initiate force against economic liberties and some are more willing to go against personal liberties. So it depends on what the assault comes, comes to, right? I mean, I feel a lot better right now in the Second Amendment area. We're going to get some good extensions of the Heller Doctrine here very soon. There's a case in the Ninth Circuit right now that's being reheard and bonk out of Hawaii, actually, that's going to the Ninth Circuit that I believe is going to extend the Heller doctrine to outside the home. And so in that regard, I think we, we got the right people on the bench. But if you're talking about things like the drug war, we got the wrong people on the bench. So until we get people on the bench that you described as libertarians okay, earlier, what, what about masks and shutdowns? Do we have the right people on the bench to deal with emergency powers? What I think is going to happen here is what's happened everywhere in the world, right? This virus, it's a real virus. And, and by the way, I think it's important to say a couple of points here. Number one, there are real viruses in the world and, and there are pandemics that are likely coming that are going to be far more deadly and more communicable than this one. So we should, the danger here, I think one of the dangers here is that we say, okay, Corona turned out to be nothing. Let's automatically assume that whatever the next one is, is also going to be nothing. And that might be a big mistake. And I think it is prudent at the beginning, like you did and like I did, 
to step back and say, hey, I don't know what we got here right now. Let's wait and see what the data is before we knee jerk and say everything's BS. Because that's not what the world, that's not the way the world is. There are real threats that, that we're not prepared to deal with right now. We got many of them. And I don't want to get too f sidetracked, but we focus way too little on the real threat, existential threat of nuclear war. We got a bunch of imbeciles right now that have the ability to destroy the world. There's one clown named Donald Trump. He by himself, without the permission of any other person, could destroy every person on the planet. Sorry, that's way too much power. This is our most urgent problem that we need to be focusing on right now. Imagine your house and every building you know about is rigged to explode at any moment when one human being presses a button. And it doesn't have to be Trump. It could be the morons in India or the morons in Pakistan who aren't getting along. So we got a lot of real threats we need to focus on. But I think it's very prudent at the beginning here. And I think a lot of people acted in good faith, not in bad faith. I think a lot of people acted in good faith, thinking that this thing could be a big major killer of human beings. And they imposed some of what we now look back with 2020 hindsight and said, unnecessary, draconian, it needs to stop. The problem here is exactly what you pointed out the inability of people to say, you know what, I'm changing my opinion here. I've been wrong on something and I'm changing my opinion. I'm so glad you said it. We all need to say it more. We need to do better. It's not a crime to say the data I had before, the opinion I had before has to be updated. And now we, we tweak our course into the right direction. So to get more directly to your question, the coronavirus, like all of these um, things we see like flu season. It comes and it goes. It's what happened in New York City. It's what happened in Wuhan, right? It's going to fizzle out. If history is a guide, recent history, we maybe have another month, maybe two, until the death count, until the people who are acting in bad faith, the people who are saying, hey, that motorcycle accident, that was a corona death. By the way, uh, in, to, in order to understand this, you have to understand that hospitals are getting about another $35,000 from the federal government if they can declare that the death was coronavirus related. Now, think of any business that's struggling right now. Take a struggling business like a hospital, which incidentally is struggling as a result of the government running the operation. The government is- right. And, and what, well, when you put it in those terms, I how can you blame someone for lying to government to get more of their stolen money back? And it's unfortunate that it's where we're set up in this kind of like Chinese finger trap. I'm, I'm sorry, Kung finger trap um, to you. Cause I want to make sure I use the most racist word possible here to describe this. I uh, know, but they, they were in a kind of Chinese finger trap situation where in, in the, the more you push, the more trapped you get. Right. So I, I want to, I want to just, before we get to, you know, your legal cases and the Live and Let Live project, uh, just to put a little point on this, with my brother, I've been, I've been giving him statistics. I've been showing him the data. And you know what? I, he, just, he just sent me a message. I kind of want to pull this up and see if, okay, yeah. So, okay, yeah. So my brother, he, I, I sent him. Two stories this morning. We have a family political chat. I sent him the story that you sent me, the Ron Paul column, and I sent him the, the Dr. Fauci going to the baseball game with his mask around his chin. And he laughs. My brother actually says, LMAO, laughing my ass off. Is this supposed to be your smoking gun or something? Why do I care about his mask behavior? And I actually, like, so I, I also sent him Ben Swan's piece because Ben Swan did a great examination of the science behind masks and, and show that it's all correlation. There's no causation. The scientific studies show that wearing a mask actually has more negative effects than not wearing a mask. And my brother just dismisses it. And I said, well, why don't you, you know, why don't you look into this? He goes, that's not a credible source. I said, well, I looked into it. I find it more credible than the mainstream. And he's just, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. Let me confirm my, if you're giving me information that doesn't confirm my biases, I'm not even going to consider it. I'm just going to dismiss it. I'm not even going to look at who it's coming from. If that information 
contradicts the conclusions that I've already come to, I'm not even going to hear it. What would you say to him? What I would say to your brother is I would immediately start using hypotheticals. I would start saying, okay, let's, let's first see if we got common ground, if we had common facts. Imagine the facts are like this and lay out the facts. And then you should be also accommodating to, to accept his facts and say, well, how should the world work if the facts were like this? And how should the world work if the facts are like that? Because since we're not really in a position to get the actual facts, to me, what's more important and more interesting is to say, if these were the facts, how should we progress? If he's got the same kind of what I'll call libertarian outlook as you and you may, this is one of the things that I think is, is a huge problem in the libertarian movement, right? Because we're at each other's throats over differences in the facts. We need to get away from that. We need to say, look, okay, let's figure out are the facts like this or the facts like this. If they're like, I do this with my buddy, Alessandro. He's, uh, he's, he's one of the smartest guys I've ever met. He's an attorney in Roma, one of my very best friends. He's a guy I call brother like you. And uh, we disagree on lots of things, uh, including global warming. And so what we do is we say, okay, imagine the facts are like this and we are in total agreement. Imagine the facts are like this and we're in total agreement. So now we don't need to argue about global warming. We can only try to get to the important facts. I think that's really good. And if you can get to that type of an agreement, then I think there's one fact that probably he'll agree to that you both can agree to, which is the number of bodies, right? How many bodies? That's the one thing I would might say to him at the second stage of this. I might say, well, would you agree if we got the same number of bodies dead this year than we had last year and roughly the same going back to the 50s, that, that the corona thing is not a major problem? Now, he may not agree with that, right? Because there are things one could say. He might say, well, because we're uh, locking down, there are fewer car accidents or something like that. But I think to the contrary, actually, so if you talk to cardiologists like my wife, who will say, look, people are not coming in, or at least weren't for a while, to get checkups, to get their meds changed, to get things like that. And that's the number one cause of death. We would expect an increase as a result of these type lockdowns, not a decrease. But I think we're going to see overall that the body count is roughly the same, maybe a slight increase. I can live with that. I could say, okay, coronavirus uh, killed some more people this year, but was it worth the gigantic economic destruction and loss of civil liberties and all those types of things. That's the discussion I think we're going to wind up having. And we need to be prepared for this discussion so we can come out of this and on the other side of Corona, more prepared to make the only argument that actually matters, which is what you said earlier in your show, what makes us qualitatively different than every other political position. To me, that's the, that's the, I'm like a broken record, Adam. If you talk to me, you know I only want to talk about one thing. <laughs> I talk about the non-aggression principle, which I now yep. call the live and let live principle. Because until we can convince more people of that, we're having different discussions, right? That's what we really should be focusing on is people who are fighting for freedom. All right, Mark, perfect segue because like, I love the message. We changed our campaign slogan to live and let live. I love that way of communicating libertarian principles. Why is that phrase so compelling and so powerful for you that you want to create a, a new movement around that idea specifically as opposed to the libertarian party or the existing libertarian you know, organizations and movement that we have today? Well, to be fair, and I want to be very clear about this, I certainly would never do anything to try to harm uh, the libertarian movement. I'm, I'm a libertarian. I've been a libertarian for 30 years, and I love everything about what the libertarians stand Yeah. By, by, by the way, if, if anybody, like, there are a lot of people who come into this movement who are like, I'm a libertarian. I've been here for three weeks. Ah, screw you guys. I'm going back to socialism. And you're like, I don't think you were ever a libertarian to begin with. I think you just found a fun label to try on for a while. Mark Victor is in the opposite category of that unquestionable libertarian credentials, both in his life and in his words, his beliefs throughout the last 30 years. I have seen nothing but hardcore principled libertarianism out of this man. So just 
to make sure that my audience knows where this is coming from. You couldn't get a more credible libertarian than Mark Victor. Yeah, and you know, like you, Adam, we've both been at this a long time. And the, see, the guy you talk about, he was never a libertarian because he never understood the principle. And that's and at the at the end of the day, that's what's wrong with the libertarian movement, right? We start on the safety the issue of I think we should be legal. Okay, well, of course we agree on this, but this is the wrong place to start the discussion, right? Because then if we convince them of that, and usually libertarians will go off in the wrong direction instead of saying, look, the reason I think weed should be legal is because I own this body and that's the end of the discussion. We go off and we talk about other very good arguments, right? Decreases in the crime rate and too many people in prison and black market dangers and all these other really good arguments. But Democrats can make the same arguments that this puts us in the same box as them and fails to get across the one point we need to get across. And so people who have been at it a long time, like me and you, are sitting here and saying, this is such an obvious thing. All we're really saying here is, uh, duh, don't you think we shouldn't hit each other over the head? Don't you think aggression is wrong? We're saying, why hasn't this movement spread like wildfire throughout the world? It should have, and it hasn't. And the reason it hasn't is because we haven't presented it properly. That's the only reason I can think of, because, look, the world is filled with reasonable and unreasonable people. The unreasonable people, OK, we can't do anything about them. But I think there's more reasonable people. And when I say reasonable, what I mean is you can reason with them. We can use conversation instead of force. That's really all we're saying. And so we haven't said it right. So I've been scratching my head and saying to myself, how can we reach these people? And because the word libertarian, once, like many other labels, right, once you hear, once a non-libertarian hears that label, you know their reaction. Oh, yeah, I know what those libertarians, they're the losertarians, they don't win the presidential elections, blah, blah, blah. And you're written off, they know everything about you. And in addition to that, I think there are some things that need to be sort of upgraded and updated because the world, we are living in the most exciting time ever to be alive, hands down. Look what's changed here in the last just few hundred years and what's changing in every one or five year increments. It's incredible. Murray Rothbard could never have understood how somebody in China could have done something that could have affected the whole world. And yet this is one of many, many examples right now. We have tons of threats. Just the threat we talked about earlier, India and Pakistan, our literal survival, the survival of every human being on the planet right now is contingent on what a bunch of screwed up people thinking in India and Pakistan, whether they're going to use nukes against each other. We should be more, we should have more to say about it than just being a sitting duck. What we should be able to say is, hey, you guys are violating the non-aggression principle by putting us at a substantial risk of imminent destruction. You're being reckless by the way you're storing them, by the way you're threatening to use them or something along those lines. We got to have some jurisdiction over them. There are people developing artificial intelligence right now. This is a huge threat to the survival of humanity. It's going to happen it's just a question of when. Same with easy nukes. Every other technology, every other technology has fallen into the hands of bad guys, people who want to initiate force. That's what a bad guy is. We have every reason to think that the technology is coming probably sooner rather than later, that everybody is, who wants a nuke is going to be able to get one. If that was the case today, right now, we'd all be dead. There's no question about that. So until we can come up with a way to convince more people imminently, urgently to accept the non-aggression principle, and this is the sad part of, of life on the planet Earth, whoever has the biggest gun gets to make the rules. And to this point, bad guys have generally had the biggest guns. They impose on us their will. That's the way the world is. Until we can get enough people, so we got the biggest gun. We can say, look, guys, here's the way the world is going to work now. There's this thing called the non-aggression principle, and you're going to comply with it. If you violate it, we're going to stop you from violating it. 
If you're not violating it, you're going to be left alone. And we have to impose that. We have to make that happen somehow. And I don't feel bad about imposing a rule on other people that says you don't get to use force, fraud, or coercion on other people. I don't feel bad about that. Lots of people disagree with me. Lots of them are my clients. They disagree. They say, no, I want to beat people up. Sorry, you don't get to get your way. We're going to put our rule on you. But the other side is also true. If you're not, if you're wearing a headscarf and you're not bothering anybody, somebody who says that's a crime, sorry, it's not a crime and you need to leave them alone. That should be the rule. You know, moral questions, questions about whether people should wear headscarves, those are moral questions. Those are qualitatively different than legal questions. We have to look, we can win this argument. If we can't win this argument, our species is doomed. There's the power and technology that we have right now for smaller people to do bigger and bigger damage around the world is only growing. We have to win this argument very quickly. And in order to win it quickly, we got to present it differently. And that's what I'm working on. That's why instead I'm putting the live and let live principle, which means the same as the non-aggression principle. We call it live and let live. It already puts the wind at our back. People love live and let live. There are ways to say it in many other languages around the world right now. So instead of getting the wind in our face when we say we're libertarians, which, by the way, is virtually a meaningless word outside the United States, we need to get out of our head fighting for a free society. We need to fight for a free world because we're at risk all over the world. So I'm writing a book to this end, and I certainly want to meet with you, Adam, as another brother in freedom because I want you to help me refine the arguments. I want to work together. I want to put our forces together and we need to reach out to the other reasonable people of the world and say, in essence, it's time for us to say aggression is wrong. And we need to do it in a professional way. We need to do it in whatever way is most persuasive to our fellow brothers and sisters. We got to get this done. and We got to get it done quickly. Absolutely. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what grows out of this new brand and messaging with Live and Let Live. Now, Mark, we've only got a couple minutes left. I, I want to I want I would be remiss if I didn't get some practical advice out of you right now. And I, I want to open this up very briefly, at least to the audience for questions. If we have some comments specifically on, on do we do we have any queued up already? Some yeah, one. All right. Let's get it on screen, please. Jim. Question for Mark. Can you comment, please, on defunding the police? That's from the secretary. This is one of the dumbest ideas I've heard in a long time. The, the function of the police, the proper function of the police, is to enforce the live and let live principle or the non-aggression principle. There are bad guys in the world, right? They are going to violate the non-aggression principle. I'm a lawyer. I don't want to chase them down. I don't got time to run DNA evidence in this. What we need to do is reform the laws that the police enforce. The problem isn't really with the police. Yes, of course, there are bad apples. There are bad apples everywhere. To the extent yeah. there are bad apples, we should get them the hell out of policing. Yes, they need more. That's a good point. I hadn't really considered this angle because as a libertarian, my knee-jerk response is, yeah, the police work for government and they serve government and they serve politicians. They don't enforce the law. They enforce the laws on the books that politicians have wrote that is illegal as opposed to law based on natural law, respect for individual rights, live and let live. But to say, do I, when, when, even if I as a libertarian say, I totally, I want the police completely defunded, that I would still have to say, well, I then want them reformed in a way that serves the people and still provides the legitimate services. And then I would want them refunded to serve the people. So yeah, you're right. Really, maybe the angle of defunding the police isn't the most helpful in making our point. But Mark, what I, what I want to ask you personally here is, you know, what legal advice do you have that's relevant for, I mean, I by the way, for people who don't know, Mark has some great videos online. If you want some legal advice about how to not talk to cops, how to deal with police interactions, there's he's got tons of good content out there. If you want more from Mark Victor, 
He's easy to find from his website. You do a YouTube search, Mark Victor, you'll find a bunch of great speeches. But Mark, specifically right now, what legal advice do you think is relevant for wearing masks, for opening businesses? Like, do, do I have to worry? You know, if, if I go out and I don't want to wear a mask, am I going to get arrested? Do, do I, should I resist? Um, if I have a small business, like you have helped that restaurant owner, should I, should I ignore these orders and say, come at me? These are all illegal. I can assert myself. What, what new legal advice do we need for what we're facing today? Well, being the attorney for freedom for the last 26 years, you can imagine I get packed with activists, right, on all kinds of things, checkpoints, drug war, people come to my office on all kinds of things. Um, and so the first question I always say to them is, do you want to be an activist? You really got to think about this, right, because there are two roads here. One is I'm going to be an activist. I'm going to make a point about not wearing masks or I'm going to thumb my nose at the government and open my business or something along those run, those that road. The other road is I'm not looking to be an activist. I want to preserve as much freedom as I have and get through the world and pursue my happiness the best I can. Those are two completely different roads. So if you want to be an activist, well, then you've got to be very careful, right? Because you don't want to get yourself into a situation where you get charged with some kind of a major felony that they can actually convict you of and put you in prison. So obviously the ways to get into big trouble there is to use force against the police or something like that. Or, um, you know, there's lots of different ways to get into problems there. If you want to be an activist, there are ways to do it where you might not get charged with a crime, but there's always a risk. So if you don't want to be an activist, well, then don't be an activist, right? If the rule is wear a mask or pay a thousand dollar fine, then you decide if you want to pay a thousand dollar fine or wear a mask, you can come in and have me challenge that for you. I'd be happy to do it, but we don't do it for free. I got hard costs like everybody else. And you could imagine, I think I probably get solicited every single day from some freedom activist with a good worthy cause to fight something. And you know, the case that you talked about, the Euro pizza case, I did take that one pro bono. We didn't get paid a dime on it because I, that issue, I just, it was one of the issues we selected at our firm to do it, as we like to say here, for the freedom of it, right? It was a misdemeanor, it wasn't a giant felony that was gonna involve hours and hours and hours and a huge trial. Okay, fine. It's a tough time for everyone right now based on what the government has done as a result of the coronavirus. They're not even charging many big cases at the moment. So it's been a big slowdown even for my business. But so if you want to be an activist, what I would suggest is why don't you come in and we should talk, okay? I probably will charge you a hundred bucks for an hour. That's as cheap as I ever get. And let's talk about what you want to be an activist for. What are you trying to accomplish? What aggravation are you willing to put up with in your life to get there? And I, I take no position of it. We need activists out there, but people need to go into it with their eyes open. If you don't want to be an activist, then you know what? Sit back and say, this is not a totalitarian police state. Life gets a heck of a lot worse than it is at the moment. We're talking about masks on your face. We're not talking about being in Nazi Germany here. There are many times in history where governments have acted far worse than they are at the moment. Be happy that we're at least where we are. Let's be peaceful activists. Join our live and let live movement. Let's do some things in the, and really all that ever matters, Adam, all that ever matters is we just need to get more people. Change never comes from the government. If you're, if you're thinking you're going to get somebody elected or you're going to pass some law or you're going to sponsor some initiative and this is going to bring about a free world, you're mistaken. The American Revolution wasn't voted in. Neither was the Enlightenment. Neither was the Industrial Revolution or any of these big changes in humanity. It's a, it's a revolution in thinking. We need more people. And some examples of this, by the way, were the recent gains we've had in both the drug war and in say gay rights, right? This didn't come from government. This came because the people in the world said, you know what, this is stupid, locking people up for having a green plant or worried about boys kissing, who's having sex with who in bed, whether they can get married, this is stupid. And then the politicians, just like predictable sheep, lick their finger and put it up in the air and say, which way is the wind blowing? 
and then they change their positions and things happen. That's the way things change in the world. What we need to focus like a laser beam on is convincing more people about the non-aggression principle. Everything else is going to take care of itself. Well, Mark, as our uh, audience is telling me, we're going to have to let you go because you're making way too much sense here. You're going to trigger the sensors at some point. But, Mark, thank you so much for joining us for your time today. It's been a lot of fun. We got your website up on the screen here. Is there anything else people should know about how to connect with you? That is not my website. I'm not sure what that is, but our website is attorneysforfreedom.com. Is not that sure. what we had up there? No, it says thefreedomline.com. I'm not sure what. No, that no, no, no. You're looking. No, no. You're looking at something else. We got your website on screen. Okay. It's, yeah. No, no we got you. We got yeah. It's got your picture on it. I want to make sure there's no like spoof. No one's spoofing your website. No, we got you. Uh, is there an email address or something else that you want to say uh, for people to contact you? People can. I'm the easiest lawyer to get a hold of on the planet. You can just go to Mark M A R C at attorneysforfreedom.com. Whether you agree or disagree, let's be big boys and girls. Happy to hear from you either way. I like to have a civilized discussion on the issues because I know I'm on the right side, right? My only position is aggression is wrong, and I, and I feel pretty good about that one. So, brother, thanks for having me on the show. It's been a real pleasure, and let's connect offline. We'll get together soon, and uh, looking forward to it. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mark. Have All right, day. ladies and gentlemen, that was a lot of fun. And uh, I, hope a, I hope a good examination, some uh, helpful perspective from an attorney about what's going on today and the legal challenges that we're facing. Now, we've only got uh, about 15 minutes left in the show. We want to take some callers. We got, some, we got anybody queued up? Everybody's like, no, we just want to listen to Mark Victor. Well, now's the time. Let's see, Jim, get that link into, the, uh, into all of our chats on YouTube, Facebook, Periscope, and Patreon, and StreamYard. For anybody who wants to call into the show today, um, I don't know. I, I, we, we might not have time to get the five callers today. Should we have like another fun contest? Like, wait. I guess the caller with we'll, we'll go with the best idea for how to fight coronaphobia. Because honestly, I don't know. Like, and, I, and I'm I'm 100 with Mark here on the imperative of changing minds, of changing the paradigm. And right now, when I like honestly, I'm I'm, I'm like this this advice I'm asking for. You know what? Here's what we'll do. Whichever caller has the best advice for what I should say to my brother. Who now just wants to laugh at Ron Paul. Wants to laugh at science. Wants to laugh at statistics. What do you say to someone who fell for this? And is simply refusing to listen to anything that challenges their worldview, their narrative. So until let's, let's get some callers queued up here, I'm just going to go just a couple headlines worth skimming here. Studyfinds.org, global frustration, online sentiments about COVID-19 have turned from fear to anger. Well, at least that's progress, right? For many people stuck in lockdown, social media is their best outlet for staying in contact with the world as the coronavirus pandemic continues to spread. Fear of the illness remains high. Unfortunately, a new study finds that fear is turning into anger as the global community anxiously awaits for a cure. Well, is that unfortunate? I think that's I think that's fortunate. I mean, it's progress. Uh, if someone's trying to scare you, like, I mean, if, if, if a mugger, and I, I hate to use this libertarian cliche, but it's very appropriate here, right? If a mugger comes and sticks a gun in your face and says, Give me your wallet. Your first response is, oh, I'm afraid, fear, and you're paralyzed with fear. Yeah, I can't take my wallet, take my money, take whatever you want, right? That's bad, right? Because your your fear is fear is a paralyzing emotional response. At least anger. Now, I'm not saying anger is good. It's still just an emotion, right? But it's better than fear in the sense that it could prompt you to action. Right. If you're just afraid of your mugger, you're, ah, you're totally paralyzed and helpless. If you're angry, you know, you're not going to go, screw you. How dare you try to mug me? Because that might get you shot in the face. Right. But at least it would prompt you to go. Hmm. Maybe I'm not just going to give up my wallet. So easily, maybe I'm, you know, at least I'm going to stop and think maybe my my anger is going to check me. 
from being submissive. So the fact that people are getting angry instead of afraid, like, that's a good thing. Now, are people angry at the virus? Gosh darn that virus that it it killed my ma and raped my pa. You know, like, no, that's not. What are they angry about? They're angry about the situation created by government governments all over the world using this virus as the excuse. Researchers at Nanyang Technological University are studying the shift in emotions being expressed on Twitter during the pandemic. Their analysis of more than 20 million tweets finds nearly 60% of online reaction expressed fear and uncertainty about the virus in January amid the start of the pandemic. So yeah, since we didn't know what was going on, yeah, hey, there's a new threat. The media is telling us we should be afraid. Of course, there's going to be more fear. Since then, fearful tweets continue to drop while messages expressing anger are on the rise. The study in JMIR Public Health and Surveillance adds angry coronavirus posts made up nearly 30% of Twitter reaction on March 12th. That is the same day the World Health Organization officially declared COVID-19 a global pandemic. So... The end to where's this going? You got a, a, a nice graphic here that charts anger, fear, sadness, and joy. I mean, like, what a cool way that we can look at information now. Now, what's interesting, so this is going back from January to April. Joy, the yellow line there is actually going up significantly from like 15% to 30. People are more joyful. That's crazy. But now the big story here, the purple line, the fear goes from 55% to under 30%. That's great news, right? People don't fall for lies indefinitely. We have the ability to admit that we were wrong, to admit that we have been fooled, and to change our position as a result. But now what this story is trying to make, uh, make, make more of a point of is that anger is up. Not that joy is up, but that anger is up. And actually, according to this chart, Joy is up more than anger. Makes you wonder about the slant they're trying to put on this. The NTU team says this shift reflects growing frustration with national quarantines as people express anger over their isolation and social seclusion. Governments must do a better job of communicating with the public to keep these frustrations from boiling over. Now, do you, do you see the pro-government bias just in that statement? Because, you know, what I what would I say? Governments must do a better job of communicating with the public to keep these frustrations from boiling over. Yeah, the mugger here has to do a much better job of explaining to you why he's mugging you so that you're not, hey, hey, don't be angry with me from stealing from you. Um, I, I was, I'm just, I'm poor. I lost my job. Because, well, Might have been because of the coronavirus shutdown. I lost my job. My family's poor. If I don't steal from you, I'm not going to be able to feed, feed my kids. So what would the government, hey, uh, do a better job of, hey, guys, you know what? We, you have to stay locked down because if you don't stay locked down, we can't take over the economy on behalf of our sponsors and rip you off so that bankers have more control over society as they buy stocks through the Federal Reserve, as, as we see that. The commercial real estate shutdowns or, you know, or the, the crisis in commercial real estate from shutting down businesses. We have to be able to shut down businesses. So please don't get frustrated. Now, if the government started actually explaining what was going on here, we'd be more angry. Why are people getting more angry? Because they are understanding this because they know what government is all about. As the uh, professor Lewin says in the university release about this study, the rapid evolution of global COVID-19 sentiments within a short period of time points to a need to address increasingly volatile emotions through strategic communication by governments and health authorities, as well as responsible behavior by netizens before they give rise to unintended outcomes. This is like, if you're getting raped, this is the guy who comes in and instead of saying, hey, can we stop this rape in progress? Can we, can we violently intervene and stop the rapist from raping you saying, hey, you know, we really need the rapist to do a better job of controlling you. We need the rapist to make sure that you don't have such an emotional response to getting raped. Lewin suggests not addressing the public's anger can lead to growing mistrust of how officials are handling the emergency. Wait a second. No, 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 no. Um, how officials are handling the emergency 
which is not really an emergency. How they're making an emergency out of a non-emergency to have emergency powers that they wouldn't have otherwise is what is fueling the public anger at this point. And if you think I'm just going by my own assumptions or responses to the shutdowns here, no, absolutely not. I'm reading the news. Like, look at the story we brought you just a few days ago in Utah where they had a mask mandate and said, we're going to shut down schools. Parents showed up angry without masks. People protesting are angry. People protesting the shutdowns and the lockdowns. And we went to the reopen Arizona protest here even months ago. Didn't seem to have much of an effect in the wave of hysteria and statistics. But what? No, people are angry because of the shutdowns, because of the lockdowns. So the story concludes, signs of joy, a ray of hope. Although researchers say over a fifth of tweets about COVID-19 are now angry ones, they note that feelings of joy and gratitude are also rising. The analysis reveals tweets expressing joy have nearly equaled fearful tweets as of May. These social media users are talking about national pride and community spirit. They use words like good news and feel good as more people recover from the illness. In Singapore, the study finds Many of these comments revolve around resilience to COVID-19 and celebrating heroic or kind acts. Well, what are the uh, heroic and kind acts? I think it's the kinds of people who are standing up to government tyranny right now, whether it's protesting the shutdowns, the mask mandates, or just going out and protesting with BLM even, standing up to federal agents in Portland and throughout the country now, enforcing martial law. Maybe anger and joy go hand in hand because I am quite happy to see that people are getting over their fear and directing their anger properly, not to the virus, but to the government that has used it as an excuse to cause so much hardship. All right, do we have any callers? No callers? Nobody wants to nobody wants to talk to me live. I'm nice to callers. Like I'm like, what do we do? We need more debates. See, like this is one of the things I'm looking forward to with getting getting Marcus, you know, more up to speed, booking guests. And now that we're pretty confident with our technical model and, and, and our distribution model, and CJ and Jim are doing such a great job supporting me and bringing you this message. We want to have more debates. Like, can we get can we get some status liberals and conservatives or even moderate statists to come on and, and debate libertarianism on this show? Well, we've got at least Dave Smith, who's, a, you know, I mean, he's a fellow libertarian who wants to debate me about racism um, and, and, and Marxism and BLM, you know, coming from the, the, the right leaning libertarian. Um, yeah, we're going to have a fun debate. But we're gonna we're gonna it's good it's like one of those debates where it's, we're gonna be really hard pressed to find something we disagree on in the first place. Um, but yeah, I mean, call like yeah. somebody just said they would call in. I sent the link again one more time because they said what's the number? Yeah, all right. So yeah, call in means click, click the streamyard link. If we weren't clear about that, that's the link that Jim has now just put in our Facebook and YouTube and um, Periscope and. Uh, Patreon feeds. All you got is click that link. Really cool system. Your browser window pops up and you can turn on your camera or your mic or both. And we'll see you here in the queue. And I'll get a wave from uh, from Jim or from CJ. We got a call already. Uh, so we got a lot of comments. I'm seeing a stream of comments here, but not uh, nobody, nobody, nobody wants to call in. I mean, I get it. Commenting is... They're all so entranced by your content. Is that it? To you. They don't want to get off their phone to do, to do the clicking, I guess. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I doubt that's the case. But no, maybe, is, is, do we do we have flame wars going on in the comment section today over Trump and racism? Uh, not necessarily over Trump. Today they've gone off about, uh, one person was trying to say that nuclear weapon, nuclear bombs aren't real. They were debating that and yeah. Nuclear bombs aren't real. Yeah, I think he was trolling the person. I think he was literally just being funny. He didn't is really that Gus? That. Is that Gus? No, with it us? wasn't Gus. No. Gus is not with us today. Gus is not with us today. Gus, we miss you. Mm-hmm. The commenters on the show, our audience, they miss your your trolling. 
Um, Okay, if that person, Robert. Yep, we got our first call in guest. All right. He made it. That was quick, ladies and gentlemen. Our first caller for Open Line Friday. So you can see how quick it was for him to go from clicking the link to being on. That's screen. it. Welcome to the show, brother. How you doing? I'm doing good, but I can barely hear you. I kept trying to figure out how to get you on the uh, speaker. Oh, I got you, Lima Charlie. I'll speak up if you can hear me. Um, but yeah, it's. I hope I, you are coming through, Lima Charlie. We got clear. I can see your ear hairs. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I can't. I can't hear you. I. I or maybe you got I your browser. Why I can't hear you. Browser volume or headphones. Anyway, hey, we'll make it really simple. What would you say to my brother, or to anybody right now, who was fooled by the first wave of Corona propaganda? and now refuses to listen to reason and science. So, why would he listen to reason and science? What, he's wearing a mask or he doesn't want to wear a mask? What's the problem? He, is, no, he, he fell for the propaganda. He wants, to, he wants everybody to wear a mask everywhere now. Oh, geez. Well, that's a shame. I mean, I wear a mask to keep from getting attacked, but only <laughs> in places I may be attacked. Um, <laughs> You know, it's not worth it, right? I mean, you got to kind of fit in. But to say that everyone needs to wear a mask is ridiculous. That, you know, right. if you're worried about it, then get yourself the N95 or stay home. Right? Yep. Um, no, I, I'm, but, I, have to, I have to go watch the whole movie Zombieland now. I haven't seen the whole thing. But you just reminded me of that. You've seen it. There's this scene, right, where um, Bill Murray playing himself is going out pretending to be a zombie so that he can go out and have a social yeah. life and interact with the zombie world. It's like, uh, crap, I got to put a mask on so I don't get attacked and I can go interact with the rest of the zombies. But I, w I don't want to do that. My position, and I, I'm, I'm surprised I haven't restated it on this episode, but my position is I will never proactively wear a mask, but I will if I'm asked to. If someone says, hey, I'm afraid because you're not wearing one, please wear it. Or before you come onto my private property, my home or my store, I'll wear it. But otherwise, it's like we're feeding into the fear. When you, when you go out with a mask on by your choice, I don't know. If I can send a positive statement instead of a negative statement, I'm going to send that positive statement. Oh, did we lose our caller? Okay, well, thank you. Who Was it, was it Rob? You said Robert, thank hey Robert Lang that I've recognized that name from calling in before. Robert, thank you so much for joining us. You know, if we want to get we get a couple more callers on. Anybody wants to call in? I don't mind going a little late today. Okay, Robert, if you you want to come back on, maybe he's got a he's got headphones or he's got his audio fixed here. Robert, back to you, brother. Now I don't have your audio. In StreamYard, no audio at all. Uh-oh. All right. Boom, 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 boom. Well, thanks for coming. Bomb, 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 bomb. Yeah, thank you so much, Robert. I appreciate your perspective on this. And I guess if someone wants to put it in the comments, what would you what would you tell someone in that situation? All right, a couple other headlines uh, just to skim through real fast from the Associated Press. China tells U.S. to close Chengdu consulate and growing spat. Yes, as a follow-up to the United States, uh, as we covered yesterday, asking the Chinese government to close their, uh, was it embassy or consulate in Houston? Uh, China ordered the United States on Friday to close its consulate in the western city of Chengdu, ratcheting up a diplomatic conflict at a time when relations have sunk to their lowest level in decades. The move was a response to the Trump's administration, Trump administration's order this week for Beijing to close its consulate in Houston after Washington accused Chinese agents of trying to steal medical and other research in Texas. China appealed to Washington to reverse its wrong decision, and Foreign Minister Wang Yi said the current difficulties are completely created by the U.S. side. But what's their excuse? It's just it, the current... So 
they, they're saying the measure taken by China is a legitimate and necessary response to the unjustified act by the United States. Pure tit for tat. Now, the only point I wanted to make really about this story today is just what another tragic consequence of statism this is. Because, and I hear this from people. Do we need a central government? Do we need a federal government? And I hear, well, we need it to be able to relate to other countries or to represent you to other countries. Like, really? I can't relate to other countries or other individuals in another country or other businesses as an individual. I need a government go-between? Really? Well, what's the effect of this? When we want trade, we want people to be able to cooperate across national borders. And instead, by having governments manage those borders, we end up with people hurting when trade gets restricted like this. Why are they doing this? Same reason as anything else, money and power. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer when government has more control over trade. All the fair trade, free trade deals that, that the government has put out, NAFTA, BAFTA, CAFTA, all the silly shit like that. What is it? It's managed trade. It's not free trade. It's always government has some authority in restricting your access to trade with someone in a foreign country. And what we're seeing right now between China and uh, the United States, the governments is just, uh, you know, a heightened level of disgusting. I think we've covered enough about what's going on in Portland right now, but I did want to get into this a little bit more with what happened with the mayor who was tear gassed. Uh, this is from the Wall Street Journal, Portland Mayor tear gassed amid protests over federal agents. By the way, CJ, I'm sorry. I got to stop doing these uh, Wall Street Journal stories because they're they're behind paywalls. And, uh, you know, the one that I wanted to read, I had it pulled up. It let me the first time and now it didn't. The other one, the, the, the how you feel depends on where you are. So, um, you know, by the way, Ed, Ed Vallejo, I don't know if Ed's listening right now, but in one of our patron only post-production shows that we did uh, earlier this week or last week, I was talking about Drudge Report. And I've always really loved the Drudge Report for being a, a news aggregator that gives you a pretty good overview of what's happening in the mainstream media today. But it also gives a bit of a counter narrative, right? And even recently, I've seen a few stories from Infowars.com, but Infowars obviously turned into a pro-Trump website. So it's not really libertarian or, or anti-authority anymore. It's really more of a pro-authority website. And, uh, you know, so it's hard. I can't really say that Drudge Report has credibility because they occasionally link to, a, to an InfoWars article. One of the things I used to like about the Drudge Report is the historical perspective. And this made it really uh, helpful for not just me, but for like a million, or millions, I don't know, thousands of, of uh, other sort of journalists and pundits who go, well, what's on Drudge? This is, this is a good, you know, aggregator. But it would also give you like historical flashbacks. Right. Do it like doing your like for me, you know, if I wanted to cover something in current events like, hey, you know, Portland mayor tear gas amid protests over federal agents like you might want to know if it was the case that the Portland mayor, uh, you know, is a hypocrite because just last week he ordered Portland police to tear gas citizens. And now he's just objecting because it's feds tear gassing citizens. I made that up. That's probably not the case. But if that was like, it would be nice to point that out, right? In your coverage, you would want that perspective. Drudge Report used to do a lot more of that. And what Ed told me last week, or was it earlier this week in our in our in our patron only show, Jim, you remember this conversation, right? Yeah, yeah. Ed was saying that, that something happened to the Drudge Report. It was, uh, he sold the posting rights. He sold posting rights, or something. Someone else, like, and you know, I I don't know. Like, I didn't. I, I was waiting for Ed to do the research on this. Yeah, I couldn't find anything. But you, did you actually look? I looked. I couldn't find anything. I mean, well, I mean, let's. If I just do a Google search for like what happened to Drudge Report, like, I, is that going to pull something up? If I go, you know, Drudge, let's see, what, what else would we search for? Drudge Report Drudge sold, report. sold right. Uh, let's see, what happened to the Drudge Report, Town of 2019? Um, what happened to the Drudge Report? Uh, the Drudge Report boasts a wildly impressive 10 billion views a year, and during the 2016 election, they used all that clout to promote and back the now President Donald Trump. 
Um, they were even on the Trump train before either con uh, before other conservative news outlets like Fox. Uh, let's see. What's going on with Drudd? Rasmussen claims. Let's see. Rasmussen claims Matt's not there anymore. Word is he sold. What? Okay, so uh, this is from December of last year. What happened to Drudge? A lot of people have been asking that question lately. If you talk to conservatives these days, you'll hear that Matt Drudge's eponymous news aggregation site has gone over to the dark side, that Matt's joined the anti-Trump resistance. And now Rasmussen reports an arguably reputable polling operations calling Drudge out on Twitter, even suggesting that the site has been sold. The whole kerfuffle appears to have begun at the end of November when the Bongino report touted as a Trump-friendly alternative to Drudge launched. Bongino taunted Drudge with a pair of tweets. Tired of Drudge, get ready. The Bongino report is almost ready for launch. Coming soon, stay tuned. Drudge has abandoned you. I never will. Um, now, this is funny that, you know, they're, they're coming out so directly partisan. Um so Rasmussen heralded Bongino's announcement, retweeting a now-deleted post from the Drudge Report account blasting the new site. So Drudge came out and actually blasted. This is interesting. So then on Saturday, Citizen Free Press, another conservative news aggregator, announced on Twitter that they're the new Drudge Report. It's funny. Since Drudge got successful, there's been a new Drudge Report like every week. Then on Saturday, uh, Rasmussen responded with a bombshell worthy of a great big drudge siren. We don't think Matt is there anymore, CFB. Word is he sold. Just waiting for confirmation. Now that will be a story. The barbs from Rasmussen kept coming throughout the weekend with Rasmussen alternately praising drudge for going the extra mile to promote polls that survey likely voters. To please of we miss you, Matt. The whole Rasmussen feed reads like a jilted lover weeping over unrequited love or weeping over lost drudge links and the page views they bring. Make no mistake, the traffic of a coveted a coveted drudge link generates can make a website's week or month or year. Yeah. So what let's see, what, what let's see last fall I included when I included the drudge report, my top conservative websites list. The comment section filled up with sentiments like this. Drudge has turned. Conservatism is right. True, correct, and he never apologized. wishy washer tweeters need not apply. Drudge, this surprised me because Matt is only use, using liberal sites for his news. Liberty Daily is the only conservative game in town for aggregators. Now, the Drudge Report certainly, you know, has some bias here and there and is, is just, you know, displayed that at different times. I don't think it's possible to uh, to present news without a bias because you are saying what is important inherently in presenting the news. From Sparta Report, this is going from 2019, breaking Drudge Report appears to have been sold, but uh, this appears uh, this very, very mysterious. I, I don't know if anybody has any updates on this from anything more than you know these rumors that we saw from last year. Um, but yeah, what is going on? I, I still think that Drudge represents an overall fair aggregator of the mainstream media. It used to be maybe more pro Trump, but that means that it was pro socialism, not that it was conservative. So I don't, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, I would love to hear some updates on that. Well, do we have any other burning comments or answers to my question about what I should tell my brother? Should we wrap this thing uh, up with the good know, news? Just wait to tell your brother. Somebody was saying that they don't think the women, they're afraid. There's nothing you can say. But I wanted to bring up, uh, mm -hmm. I know we're a little bit over time, but, you know, people are allowed to call back multiple times to win the contest. And Robert has this stuff figured out. I think he's got headphones. And I think we just, okay, Robert, if you want to come back in, sign off. You're the winner today. Robert, let's bring you back for a victory lap. There we go. I didn't even, didn't even know you had a contest going. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for joining us anyway. What we're doing, we're just giving away membership to the producer club. And we'd love to have your feedback and your thoughts, your contributions to help make this show everything that it can be, Robert. So congratulations. 
you won today's contest as our only caller membership in the Adam versus the Man Producers Club. <laughs> Anything else on your mind before we wrap up the show with the good news today? Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. I, I feel like a winner now. Um, <laughs> no, I, you know, I mean, I'm on a mission. I, I, I get cops to leave peaceful people alone. I uh, defended myself in court for years and uh, I get uh, help people defend themselves in court, you know, peaceful people who've done no harm. But now I get cops. I used to get them to quit their jobs. Now I get them to uh, leave peaceful people alone and they love it. Every cop that I've talked to has shook my hand and they love it. So I'm just trying to start this uh, movement, I guess, to win the cops over and declaw the politicians. Because without the cops, the politicians don't have the control, right? You know, if we can get the cops to stop punishing peaceful people for disobeying politicians dictates, then we have freedom, correct? Yeah, well, hey, that's beautiful word. How is it that you're connecting with cops? Well, I get them to pull up their moral principles. You know, they're, they're not used to doing that. So I kind of help them, you know, it's kind of like therapy and I get them to morally justify what they're doing. And I've had a lot of cops say, well, uh, you know, the law, my job. And I say, yeah, but how do you morally justify it? And that starts a conversation. And they usually let me drive away with no license or tag or insurance. And they thank me. They, they think it makes sense to leave peaceful people alone because their lives become more peaceful. Right. So, so that's what we wanted to do. So I was thinking when I asked the question, like, how are you actually coming into contact? You just get pulled over a lot and have good conversations. Like, that's cool. Yeah, because I don't have a tag or insurance and a license or anything. So they pull me over. I got dark tinted windows. And they pull me over all the time and I just have a conversation with them. You know, they always try to get ID from me, but I tell them, no, I can't do that. I'm sorry. And they're like, what do you mean you can't show me ID? You know? And I say, well, it goes against my moral principles. You know, if I obey you, it'd be like condoning threats of violence against a peaceful person. You wouldn't want me to do that, would you? And then wow. you just start the conversation. <laughs> yep, that's. Now, see that? Ooh, I like that's an. I hadn't heard that angle yet. I don't think that's a really good one to say. You know, I can't because I would be contributing to this evil that you're doing. Of course, you don't say it that way, but yeah, right. that I I would be hurting peaceful people by contributing to what you're doing. That's and you have generally positive results. Like, if you oh got yeah, anything? they love it. They, you know what it is, is that they have moral principles. They just keep them suppressed to do that job, right? You know? All right, so Robert, let me, Robert, let me, let me, uh, for for the benefit of our audience, let's, because because I assume you're you're not recording these if you're having that success and that's not a part of the the interaction, right? No, I record all of them. Yeah, I carry a camera in my hand. To so do they know it, that you're recording? You do. You, you hold the camera up and they know that they're being recorded. At first, I used to hide it from them, but then I started telling them about it, and it went better after that. You know, once I, I would get right out of the car and I would show them that I'm going to record this, and then they're like, "Okay." Whoa, 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 whoa! You get pulled over and you get out of the car. Well, I don't pull over on the side of the road. They usually follow me, and I go to a gas station or at night, make sure I'm in the lit area, and I try to get in front of a camera, and I jump out of the car as fast as I can. I lock the door because I don't want them in my car. Right. Ah. And I don't want them towering over me, you know, and, and, and I don't want yeah. to be in a submissive position. Ooh. Now, okay, because I, 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 when if you get pulled over on the side of the road and you get out of the car, I, I'm not going, oh my God, that's a road hazard. But uh, oftentimes police will take that as an act of aggression or resistance. But if you're doing it at a gas station or like a Walmart parking lot or, or something like that, where at least they know there are other people around, it, it's kind of de-escalating in and of itself. So it makes sense that you'd have more success with that. Oh, yeah. I want people around. I want witnesses. I want lights. Um, I want them to know they're on camera. You know, and I want to have a civil conversation with them. See, I'm trying to win them over. I'm not trying to tell them they're doing anything wrong or trying to embarrass them or trying to argue with them. Right. I'm simply trying to reach out and say, look, I'd rather have you live by your moral principles than to use these politicians dictates as an excuse to harm and threaten peaceful people. Right. Your All life right, becomes hey, Rob, more Robert, peaceful you, when you leave. Uh, hey, 
Hey, Robert, what do you say you join us for a uh, patron-only post show today and we pull up one of your videos and, and watch it together? You up for that? Yeah, sure. Let's do All it. All right, let's do, do it. All right, so we're going to sign off. And if you would, since you're the winner today, Robert, send Jim an email right now, jim at thefreedomline.com, and he will get you the link to the Telegram as well as to our post show for patrons only. Congratulations. We're going to wrap things up for our main show. Then we can take our time talking to you, Robert. I'm excited to get into this both for myself and the benefit of our patrons who I know are very eager to find ways to interact with police more effectively. So Robert, thank you. We'll talk to you again in just a few minutes, maybe five, 10, we'll get you plugged back in here. Thank you everybody for tuning in to Adam versus the man today. We're going to wrap this up with goodnewsnetwork.org's good news in history for July 24th. Today would have been the 100th birthday for Bella Abzug, a lawyer nicknamed Battling Bella. She was a social activist for peace, a U.S. Congresswoman, and a fierce fighter for women's rights, chairing several White House commissions and founding organizations that work around the world. You know, it's funny, isn't this the... Uh, the, the documentary or the movie, there was a movie based on her life, wasn't there? No, no, no. I'm thinking of something else. We were watching with uh, with, with Peter and Helen about this. But, um, yeah, sorry. My bad. Totally crossed wires. Anyway, always wearing her characteristics hat, characteristic hat. She was the author of two successful books, including Bella, Miss Abza Goes to Washington. Oh, you know what it is? Oh, my gosh. I just made the connection, and I just realized why I got my wires crossed on this one. Abzug is a character from the Monkey Wrench Gang by my favorite anarchist author, after Maria Rothbard, I suppose, Edward Abbey. If you haven't read the Monkey Wrench Gang, you should read it. It's a classic. It's and now I'm like, oh my gosh! I don't, now I got I got like Abzug. I got now I'm like I'm my my like literature dork brain from high school is all triggered. Abzug, <laughs> Monkey Wrench Gang. I gotta I gotta I gotta figure this out. Monkey Wrench Gang, uh, reference. But yeah, that that's ooh, that's a good one. I'm I'm accidentally appreciating literature I read in high school more so now covering the good news in history. So yes, Bella Abzug, someone that I didn't recognize that Ed Abbey was uh, trying to promote and celebrate by naming one of the great characters in his book, The Monkey Wrench Gang After. By the way, uh, yeah, she's definitely a positive character in the book, super sexy woman. And uh, it's, yeah. There's a sex scene in Monkey Wrench Gang where he describes it, her and um, hey Duke, and by the way, if you know Hey Duke Lives, Hey Duke, better reference from the Monkey Ranch Gang. He describes their bodies like two boxcars colliding. <laughs> Isn't that an interesting way of describing a sexual encounter? Yeah. Two boxcars, like, ah, boom, and we're linked. Ah, there's not a lot of, because mm, you, you know how like a train, yeah. like box, like, is, like it links, like, rah. It's, it's an odd way of describing genitals, like boxcar, but yeah, colliding legs like boxcars. It's an interesting way of describing sex. Very, very literary. Uh, Brigham Young, more good news on this day. On this day in 1847, Brigham Young led 180, 148 Mormons fleeing from religious persecution into Salt Lake Valley and following 17 months of travel, they established Salt Lake City leading to them eventually conducting religious persecution, promoting the uh, defeat of the gay marriage bill in California just a century and a half later. On this day in 1911, American academic Hiram Bingham III, after being guided by indigenous farmers, became the first Westerner to lay eyes on Machu Picchu, the 15th century Incan citadel set on a high peak in the Andes Mountains in Peru, and later wrote an instant bestseller, Lost City of the Incas. On this day in 1929, the Pact of Paris went into effect as an international treaty providing for the renunci excuse me, renunciation of war as an instrument of national policy. 62 nations 
ultimately signed the Kellogg brand pact named for the French and American politicians who drafted the pact that heavily influenced later international law. Now, yes, the governments in order to continue to exist must pretend to be anti-war. It's a good step on the way to them actually being anti-war. On this day in 1974, U.S. President Nixon was ordered by the Supreme Court to turn over subpoenaed White House tapes, tape recordings to the Watergate prosecutor. Um, let's see, on this day in 2001, Simeon Saxa Coburg Gotha, the last Tsar of Bulgaria when he was a child, became the Prime Minister of Bulgaria and the only monarch in history to regain political power through democratic election to a different office. On this day in 2005, Lance Armstrong won a record-setting seventh Tour de France nine years after being given a 50% of chance of dying from testicular cancer. And happy birthday to Kristen Chenoweth, the actress and singer of Broadway films, turning 52 today. But don't worry, we won't tell you how old she actually is. Um, let's see, who else do we have here? Happy first 51st birthday to Jennifer Lopez. J-Lo, all right. Um, let's see, who else? I'm not going to read you all of Jennifer Lopez's biography here, but there you go. Um, I guess that's it. Happy birthday to all of our July 24, 25, and 26 birthdays today. We've got a little extra patron-only special feature today featuring Robert Langdon and his video. Is it Langdon? Did I get the last name right there, Jim? Landon. Landon. Thank you. Because I've seen him in comments before, in emails and stuff. He's been an active member of our audience. We're going to do a breakdown of one of his videos interacting with police at a traffic stop. With that being said, have a great weekend. Peace and love, y'all. Choose happiness and be excellent to each other.